Welcome back to the start of the 2002-2022 college football season. BYU and South Florida here at Raymond James Stadium in Tampa. And uh, the sunshine is obscured. Cloud cover right now. And some dark clouds involved in the cloud cover. But uh, for the most part, uh, right now, nothing in the way of precipitation close. What are you seeing out there in the atmosphere, Bradley? Well, it looks like they just put up on the jumbotron that we've entered a rain delay. Oh, wow. So there must be lightning in the vicinity because we're not feeling anything in the way of we're not seeing or feeling any rain and i'm going to check the radar yeah. to see where that is but it must be uh, are you seeing lightning uh so, Mike mitch yeah great I, well I, I didn't see any but i did just get report that light vicinity so we're clearing the field um I, i'm not sure how long the delay is but it it, it has it is official that it's going to be a delay wow so we're not even yet underway and we have our first delay we talked earlier uh, that, that the way the weather was the last couple of days, delays would have been in the offing had the game been played either on Thursday or Friday. And here on Saturday, before even kickoff, the field was being cleared, and we are going to have a delay before this game can get underway. I'm checking the radar, and, and again, uh, the, the prevailing pattern is, is to the northwest. But there is a small cell developing to the southeast coming toward Tampa, and evidently enough in the vicinity that they're going to delay this for a short time. At least the, the kickoff was supposed to be in two minutes, at uh, two minutes past the hour, but we are in our first weather delay. It'll give us time to give you our projected starting lineups for today's game, brought to you by Larry H. Miller Auto, conveniently located in Provo, Linden, and Orem. Larry H. Miller Auto driven by you. Again, these will be our projected starting lineups for BYU on offense and defense. We expect these to be pretty close to accurate based on what we've seen during camp and knowing the injury situation, which does have Gunnar Romney out for the day. We'll go with BYU on offense, and we'll start up front from left tackle to right tackle. Number 71, Blake Freeland at left tackle. Number 56, Clark Barrington at left guard. Number 70, Connor Pay at center. Number 76, Harris Lachance at right guard. And number 78, Kingsley Suamataia at right guard. Wide receivers, if they go in a three-wide set, we'd expect it to be Puka Nakua, number 12, Keanu Hill, number 1, and Chase Roberts, number 27. That's the first three wideouts. You could also look for number 20, Braden Cosper, and number 0, Cody Epps. At tight end, number 83, Isaac Rex, and number 5, Dallin Holker. A lot of double tight for BYU expected. And when they go triple tight, number 13, Mason Wake gets into the mix. Starting quarterback for the Cougs, number 3, Jaron Hall. His backup is number 17, Jacob Conover. At tailback, number 2, Chris Brooks is the primary back. Number 4, Lopini Katoa. Number 21, Jackson McChesney. Number 19, Miles Davis. The next backs in the lineup. Defensively, BYU expected to go across the front with... Number 92, Tyler Batty at one defensive end. Number 94, John Nelson at the other defensive end. Caden Haas, number 95, and Lorenzo Fawatea, number 55. The projected starting tackles for this day. And the other D linemen expected to get a lot of run, and there are six of them. Number 93, Blake Mangelson. Number 91, Earl Tuioti Mariner. Number 98, Gabe Summers. Number 53, Fisher Jackson. Number 59, Logan Lutui. And number 51, Eldon Tofa. Starting corners for the Cougs. Number 5, D'Angelo Mandel. And number 18, Caleb Hayes. But Kayla, uh, Kalani telling me in the pregame that uh, both uh, starting corner, uh, both corners could be expected to be manned by two cornerbacks. And so you're rotating in number 11, Gabe Judy Lally. And number 0, Jacob Robinson. Starting safety is number, th- number 12, Malik Moore. And number 22, Ammon Hanneman. Backed up by Hayden Livingston and Micah Harper. George Udo plays the nickel. Jacob Boren also involved at nickel. And then the solid linebacking core for, for BYU features. Number 41, Keenan Peely. Number 31, Max Tooley. Number 2, Ben Bywater. And number 49, Peyton Wilgar. The primary backups, Jackson Kofusi and Pepe Tanobasa. Kavika Gagne may also be in the mix at linebacker. Those are starting lineups and some backups for BYU. Brought to you by Larry H. Miller Auto. Conveniently located in Provo, Linden, and Orem. Larry H. Miller Auto, driven by you. We are officially in a weather delay, and we've yet to begin play. And the fans are filing for the concourses right now. And, Riley, a lot of those fans in BYU blue. Always great to see when we head on the road. Yeah, it's uh, great. I, for as uh, hard as success has been to come by for this South Florida team, there's also quite a contingent of Bulls fans in there. But uh, it's week one, and hope springs eternal. Uh, for both sides, but it's always great to see the blue. You mentioned BYU blue. I will say overwhelmingly royal. So good job by Kalani in making the decision <laughs> to try and bring that back. The, Sam, the fans have seen to really embrace it. 
Atmospherics, uh, 90 degrees, but it feels like of 102 with humidity at 62%. And again, checking the radar map, uh, nothing in terms of red or yellow right over our location, but enough in the vicinity to put us into a delay. The game preceding BYU on ESPNU, and for those who are watching along today, maybe watching and listening, turning down the sound, uh, that game has been a wild one, and that's uh, in the final 30 seconds of play. North Carolina has taken a 60, is it a 63-56 lead? Correct. They just recovered an onside kick at the end and uh, have gone ahead late. And so we'll see if that game ends up before this one gets underway as we are in a weather delay. Let's take a one-minute break. We'll uh, actually take a two-minute break. Uh, For those tuning in down the line, we're going to throw a two-minute break at our affiliates. We're yet to kick things off. We're in a weather delay here in Tampa. Let's break for two minutes for our network and affiliate stations. We'll break for two on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. You're listening to BYU Football on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Whether you're planning a simple backyard party or a large event, Diamond Event and Tent has exactly what you need. From tables, chairs, and linens to tents, dance floors, and stages, Diamond has an amazing inventory to choose from and a professional staff that will help you pull it all together. Diamond Event and Tent serves the entire Wasatch Front, and you can either pick up your party rental items or have them delivered. Visit DiamondEvent.com. Now back to Riley Nelson and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel, on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. All right, to back here at Raymond James Stadium, Tampa, Florida. This game was scheduled for a kickoff at two minutes past the hour. It's now six minutes past the hour, and the field has been cleared. The stands were in the process of being cleared as we are in a weather delay. Thunderstorms in the vicinity, and we've yet to begin play here in Tampa. Let's head back to our BYU Radio studios, and our studio host, Jason Shepard, is uh, watching the scoreboard that is jam-packed full of football today. Shep. Yeah, and you guys were referencing the game that is preceding ours on ESPNU, and it has been an absolutely unbelievable game, and it's becoming even more so. Uh, There's 20 seconds to go. North Carolina leading at App State, 63-55. to But the call, uh, maybe not necessarily the call, but it's the pass uh, on the going for the win call. They tied it up, speaking of App State, so they, instead of kicking the extra point to tie it up and then likely playing for overtime, they decided to go for two and the win. The App State quarterback, they, they, they had it. I mean, wide, wide open. open in the, the receiver, what, nobody was around him, and the App State quarterback overthrew him. Then the following play, they try and go with the onside kick. Chef, it's, did you notice, though? What happened? App State, App State conceded the onside kick. Yes. They let him run it back. To get the ball back. To, yeah, to get the ball back. And then they returned it past the 50. So they're automatically, now they just completed it all the way down to the 26. Yeah, so right now, we, I know we have to be careful doing play-by-play of games that we don't have the rights for. <laughs> so yeah. uh, 14 seconds to go. App State with the ball down by eight. But they are deep in North Carolina territory. So that's the situation in this game. This has been one of those crazy games. Let's update you on other action uh, going on right now. In fact, actually, this is not going on right now because they are in a delay, and I'm going to assume that this is weather-related as well. Number six, Texas A&M with a lead over Sam Houston. It is 17 to nothing in favor of the Aggies, but that game has been in a delay for quite some time. Uh, also going on right now, uh, speaking of uh, BYU's future conference, Iowa State in action at home. They are hosting uh, Southern uh, Missouri, it looks like. Southern Missouri State, excuse me. Uh, And that game going as you would certainly expect it to right now. Iowa State with an 18-point lead in the third quarter by a score of 28-10. to UCLA and Bowling Green, that game uh, under two minutes to go in the first half. The Bruins leading Bowling Green 24-17. to One of the big matchups Featuring two teams in the top 15, number 11, Oregon, who obviously BYU will face in a couple of weeks up at Autzen Stadium, uh, taking on number three, Georgia. Georgia strikes first, Bulldogs up by a score of 7 to nothing, 114 to go in the first quarter there. Number nine, Oklahoma, 
leading UTEP 21 to nothing. That game's still in the first quarter. 6.43 to go. Sooners coming out strong. Number 16, Miami taking on Bethune-Cookman. 7-3 is the score in the first quarter in favor of the Hurricane. Number 19, Arkansas, who BYU will face this season. And number 23, Cincinnati, are in the first quarter. It is 7-0 in favor of the Razorbacks. Number 24, Houston at UTSA. No score as the first quarter has come to an end. Also in the first quarter, Arizona at San Diego State. The Wildcats with a 3 nothing lead in that game. Let's uh, try and catch you up if I've missed any other top 25 games that are going on right now. Uh, it does not look like, uh, well, let's see, just uh, about five minutes into this, when number 21 Ole Miss and Troy, they are scoreless. Uh, coming up a little bit later on, number 7 Utah on the road at Florida. So not too far from where BYU is playing, just a couple of hours uh, over in Gainesville. Also later on tonight, number 14, USC taking on Rice. Number 10, Baylor, who will be in Provo next Saturday, taking on Albany, that game being played in Waco. Illinois State at number 18, Wisconsin. Number 20, Kentucky, hosting Miami of Ohio. Uh, this is going to be an interesting final score. Number 1, Alabama, hosting Utah State. The Aggies last week surviving a really poor start and then blowing out their opponent. They will go to number one, Alabama. Also later on today, this is a good one. Two top five teams, number two, Ohio State, and number five, Notre Dame. Uh, some finals from earlier today, number eight, Michigan, defeating Colorado State 51-7. And number 13, NC State, defeats East Carolina 21-20. Uh, the East Carolina punt, or excuse me, kicker missed an extra point that would have tied it up. Also missing the game-winning field goal as well. So NC State, 13th ranked in the country, they survive. While we're talking about uh, other games going on, might as well mention what we've got going on on campus as well. And this is a game that you will hear on the New Skin BYU Sports Network. Uh, number six, BYU women's soccer at home tonight. This is the third game of three that they have played this week. A 2-2 draw on Monday against Colorado. A 3-2 loss on Thursday night and now hosting CSUN at 8 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, I will have the call alongside Rachel Manning Jorgensen and uh, we'll have that for you coming up tonight at 8 o'clock Mountain Time. Also on campus, and you can check this out on BYU TV, it is number seven BYU women's volleyball taking on Pitt. So lots going on in college football. That's what's going on elsewhere here on campus. Uh, let's head back to Raymond James Stadium and rejoin Riley Nelson and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. Jason, thank you. Mentioned that uh, the game preceding this football game, BYU and USF, is North Carolina App State on ESPNU. And that North Carolina App State game is not yet final. App State had a second two-point conversion attempt in the final minute. The first one was a chance to take a lead. This one was a chance to tie. But App State fails on another two-point try. 63-61, North Carolina Leads App State, nine seconds to go. App State will try one more onside kickoff, and that might just do it. But, uh, wow, it's heartbreaking to see how close App State has been to uh, taking uh, to either knocking out or knocking down North Carolina or taking them in the, in the, into overtime. And the two-point plays will let them down. The crazy thing was the second attempt, they called the exact same play as the first attempt, trying to call North Carolina's bluff. North Carolina was in man in the first one, zone in the second. And he actually, the quarterback actually had a window to put the ball on the body of the defender in the flat, whereas the first time he was wide open in the field. Anyway, bottom line is, I just, college football is back, baby. I love it. All these crazy points, six TDs in the fourth quarter, two 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 point uh, attempts to try and win the game, both of the times where the quarterback quarterback you know one it was right there and he just physical play the second one he it was a decision making um well it, it, hopefully that the game for us today at least for BYU fans doesn't carry that much excitement but if we saw 124 points probably wouldn't be sad about that either would we Greg 
Well, yeah, it's like, yeah, as long as BYU ends up with the... Uh, Has the majority of those the, 124, yeah. yeah. The, the greater percentage. I, I think about this weather delay relative to what Kalani was saying in our pregame interview. By the end of it, he's like, this is such a long wait. He said he was just so ready to go, and uh, Kalani and the coaches will now have to uh, to cool their heels a little longer. And, and Aaron Roderick talked about being prepared for a delay, but more about an in-game delay. How do you reset and restart? But, I mean, these guys warmed up and got themselves ready to go mentally and physically, and they worked up quite the lather in the heat and humidity, and now they're going to, you know, chill out and uh, ideally not have it last, you know, you know, more than an hour, let's say, because uh, uh, this game was scheduled for an 0-2 kickoff. We're already 13 minutes past the projected kickoff time. And once weather clears, it could be anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes before they actually, uh, you know, get restarted again. So, um, you know, th- this could be closer to an hour-long delay. They had one of the local news weathermen on the on the Jumbotron giving a weather uh, report for this game specifically. And he said there was nothing particularly in the p- forecast. He just said, as we typically see in the late summer here in Florida, afternoon thunderstorms are in the forecast. So it's not like there's a storm pattern coming through. It's just what normally kicks up around Florida, which to me is a little bit disheartening because we're really at the way. If you knew it was a storm, you could track it and it could pass and you could have some time. Uh, But right now it just kind of sounds like it's luck of the draw. Well, we've uh, we've been told informally we could be looking at a 10 to 15 minute wait from this point. That could be encouraging if that uh, window actually holds. We're in a weather delay here at Raymond James Stadium in Tampa ahead of BYU in South Florida. BYU ranked 25th in the country coming into the game. 10 and 3 last year. South Florida 10 and 2, or rather 2 and 10, beg your pardon. 2 and 10. For South Florida, BYU 10-3 and three last year. The earliest this game will start, we're told, uh, it will be 4.32, which will be 16 minutes from now. So that would be a 30-minute delay from the projected start time for BYU and USF. Greg Grubel, Riley Nelson, Mitchell Jurgens with us here at uh, Raymond James Stadium. Mitchell, you've had to clear the field. I'm not sure if Mitchell still gets us with his signal, depending on where he is. If Mitch can hear us, he could tell us where he's located right now during this delay. Not sure Mitch is able to hear us right now or communicate with us. Yeah, yeah Mitchell cleared the uh, cleared the field along with everybody else. So uh, I'm not sure if Mitch can even get a signal to us from where he's located. But uh, Mitch has, along with everyone else, uh, left the field, the playing surface, to uh, to seek cover during this delay, as all have been requested to do. And the stands are almost entirely empty. Uh, in the vicinity of the pirate ship, there are a lot of fans milling about, but they've been asked to leave the seating area. So many in the concourses, some under the overhangs, but almost no one in their in their uh, in their allotted seats as we get ready for this football game. Riley, a point I wanted to address and and, and hit while we have a few minutes is the Gunnar Romney injury and absence. And BYU's done a pretty good job of uh, of keeping things tight when it comes to what gets out about the injury suffered during camp. No season-ending injuries, which is good. But Gunnar Romney was going to be a question mark coming into the season, and he will not play today. And the question is, how many games does Gunnar miss? And that's unfortunate because Gunnar's, you know, lone challenge really has been staying on the field uh, to this point in his career. So without Gunnar Romney, uh, the cupboard's not exactly bare today, or as long as Gunnar is away. Let's chat briefly about the weapons BYU does have without Gunnar Romney. We know about Puka Nakua. We know about Keanu Hill. We've seen snippets of Cody Epps. Uh, Braden Cosper didn't get to play last year, and Chase Roberts was also sitting last year after his mission. And uh, Cosper and Roberts, I'd expect both to get reps, and I'd expect Roberts to maybe even feature a bit today for BYU. Meantime, Nakua and Hill, they've got reps, they've got touchdowns, and they'll be leaned on today without Gunnar Romney. In the little I was able to observe fall camp, I expect Keanu Hill to get a ton of work in the red zone. You're going to see, obviously, Pukunakua is going to be a guy who's going to get, uh, he's going to get a lot of red zone touches too, but he's going to get a lot of first and second down looks. He seems to be the main guy in their wide receiver screen game that uh, is dialed up for him. But to also, su- they're going to supplement it with the players you just mentioned, Greg, but expect heavy, heavy usage of the three tight ends you mentioned earlier on in our pregame coverage. Aaron Roderick, this last week in, a, in one of the preparatory uh, press conferences said that Mason Wake, Isaac Rex, and Dallin Holker are three of the best football players on the team. And so, of course, it's his job as a coordinator to make sure that they are on the field and in positions to impact the game as much as possible. So you mentioned a lot of two two, uh, tight end sets. I would expect quite a bit of three tight end sets. So that's 13 personnel, one running back, three three tight ends. Mm 
uh, to and, and then two wide receivers on the field to both supplement the the loss of Gunnar Romney, but more so put as stated by Aaron Roderick, some of your best players in the position to impact the game. So it shouldn't be something that BYU uh, struggles mightily without. Yes, you want him on the field. He's a great benefit to you, but uh, they're certainly not without options. The, it speaks to the depth that has been built by Coach Sataki in his tenure as BYU's head coach, is that there's no longer, it feels like, a single point of failure, that if you lose one guy, it's going to significantly impact the fortunes of the team. As you just stated, of course, you want your full complement of players, and of course, for the individual, you want him to have a chance to capitalize on all the hard work and investment that he's made into the program, but pro, but program wide, the depth is such that uh, the next man mentality can not only take over but actually be true in BYU's case in that they should not have a significant drop off losing any singular player. From the next man mentality to our third man on the broadcast, Mitchell Jurgens. Mitchell has left the playing field but is joining us on the headset. Uh, Mitchell, where are you and what do you know? Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm in the tunnel, um, just kind of where, where the players, where the BYU players will come out um, and sitting down waiting for the call to come back. We haven't received any word on what the timing looks like. Um, I, and none of the players have left the locker room yet. I've, I've got a good eye on the locker room, but uh, so it's still pretty quiet. Hopefully this passes. It's uh, uh, ready for football to start. So, Did everyone go to the locker room? Everyone just retreated to the locker room? Yep, everyone's back in the locker room. I'm sure just, you know, whether it's taking off the gloves, taking off the cleats to kind of let their feet breathe. Mitch, did Uh, they even come out? They did. So they they came out. They were lined up in the tunnel when the weather delay came and had to retreat back to the locker room. During your playing days, Mitch, I know we've had a few, but I I, I sometimes miss the time frame of when you were and were not playing. Did you go through any of these? As far as weather delays, I did don't remember you put, us so ever being delayed. We did. I did play in the bowl game in the Poinsettia Bowl against Wyoming. That was a, it was a downpour. It was a wet yeah. one. But I don't think we ran into a delay. We just played through. There was no lightning, um, so it was just a just a rain game. When Texas came to Provo, there was a delay that. Yeah. Th- so I I wasn't but rostered. He was not a, yeah. I, I, or I wasn't dressed for that game. Oh, so, got it. Um, yeah, it, it wasn't one where I had to kind of fight the urges to come out and and you're all amped up and then told to go back to the locker room. So I, I don't think in my three years um, in a uniform actually had to deal with a rain delay. Yeah, I can, I can count on one hand. I th- and, I'm, and we are talking about maybe four or five weather delays that I can remember during the entire time that I've, I've called games as play-by-play. I had a couple as a sideline guy, but uh, yeah, you might get one once every, once every two, three years. Uh, at, our, in Charlottesville, memorably, years and years ago, yeah. it was a significantly long. It was, it was a maybe close to a two-hour weather delay in Charlottesville a number of years ago. That was and in 13. And then our first, I remember because it was my first, uh, as a broadcast team, uh, Utah in 2019, or 2018 was a lightning delay. So, anyway. Was that, was that your first game with us? That was, yeah. First game of the season. That made it memorable because it was headset. a delay, right? right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're at, uh, we're at 20 minutes right now past our scheduled kickoff time of 4.02 Eastern, 2.02 Mountain. We're at 4.22 here in the Eastern time zone. And we are officially still in a weather delay. And I'm uh, checking my pocket radar app and uh, seeing where things are developing again most of the heavy stuff was in terms of red and yellow was was drifting to the northwest but now there is a cell uh, developing from the southeast and drifting to the south of tampa and that could be the one that has in, in the in, in the delay that's where the most prevalent uh, lightning bolts are taking place right now at least on uh, on on the radar map uh, the last time uh the cougars were actually on the field uh just the in, in the independence bowl uh, there was a rain delay at the start of that one. So I, I, didn't, I didn't remember it being a long one, but uh, my stats intern, Paul Morrison, reminds us that uh, in, in Shreveport, the rain that day led to a bit of a delay to kick off that game. I uh, Honestly, our games get pushed so much because of the games yeah. before them. That's probably what it felt like to me. I did well, not remember that. But And, Greg, I actually remember that one. That was the... So that Shreveport game, I wore the wrong shoes, and the, the whole game, it, I mean, it rained the whole game, and my socks, when I got home that night, they were freezing, they were wet, and uh, I, I'll definitely remember, especially when it gets cold, in these potential weather forecast games, 
wear boots, wear some shoes where the water's not going to seep through because that was a uh, – I remember that one vividly. Yeah, that, that, was, that, that was an unpleasant day in every way oh, uh, for, for BYU football. Broadcasters, players, fans, uh, that was a rough one. And that's the last game BYU played. And, and Kalani has said, uh, Riley, that, that the way BYU played that game and the way BYU finished that season – uh, took a little bit of the edge off of 10 wins, took a little bit of the shine off a 10-3 and three campaign that it didn't finish the right way and actually did impact how the team started prepping for 2022. When we had media day at the end of June, that, to me, like, I walked away and was like, wow. Like, that game impacted these guys significantly. It was brought up by mo- unprovoked. People mm-hmm. weren't asking, hey, talk about UAB, talk about the bowl game. Players were and coaches were mentioning it unprovoked to where it left a bad taste in their mouth, which to me has added to the excitement of seeing they are like a horse chomping at the bed or a bull about to be led into the ring. Uh, I was looking so forward. I'm going to have to obviously wait a little bit longer, but looking so forward to see how they were going to come out and start here against the season because of the bitter taste that that uh, game left in the mouths of players and coaches. And they're having to wait, yes, even a little longer today. And so that uh, that hunger to play is increasing by the minute as we wait through this weather delay at Raymond James Stadium. When you come to the southeast, Florida, or these parts in early September or mid-September, it's always an issue. And oftentimes you're talking about tropical storm hurricane season coming into the mix in, in late summer, early fall. And, and a lot of college football this time of year finds itself in delays for those kinds of storms. This not of the tropical storm variety, but of the straight thunderstorm variety. And the storms in the vicinity have us in a weather delay. BYU and South Florida ready to meet for the third time all time. BYU won the last meeting, and that was just last season, September 25th, 2021. BYU won that game 35-27, but did lead the game 21-0. Three, uh, two years prior to that, three years ago now, October 12, 2019, USF won the game 27-23. And that was another game in which BYU had a lead and let it slip that time for the loss. Let's talk a bit about that game in 2019, Riley, because it was Jaron Hall's first start in place of an injured Zach Wilson at the time. And Jaron was playing well in his first start. Had he finished the game, there's a good chance BYU wins that game. Definitely does. He had that memorable, it was about a 50 50- it was somewhere between 40 and 50 yard run that was really good he was completing balls all over the field doing really good making again I said even from the very get-go the very beginning of Jaron's career you could see that he was making good decisions he was careful with the football he's completing a lot of passes on the edge he was obviously commanding the pace and uh, tempo of the offense Uh, and then yeah I mean he took a hot it, it was that year and the hit he took against Utah State like he took the hits, and he wasn't out on the field. He w- it didn't seem to be any particularly violent collision. He just kind of didn't come back in for the next series. So, he obviously, between last year, he put that behind him. Uh, but Ten minutes and five seconds in that 94-yard, 19-play drive. And, and, and that was, I'm not going to say thematic, but there were a number of games last year in which you know, teams just did kind of grind things out. And BYU, in some ways, was like, well, okay, well, if, if, if a team has to use that much, that much time to get down the field, you, you, may, you, may take the, uh, you may take the backside of it. And if you have a 21-point lead, that's another reason. BYU wasn't trying necessarily to get a quick change or, or get the ball back or anything. They were content to let USF not waste but spend nine plus minutes on the clock because they had such a comfortable lead and then when they had the eight point lead at the end 35 27 BYU ended the game with the ball and that was another theme on the positive side on the offensive side was that BYU became expert at four minute drill last year which you know two minute is when you're behind and have to score four minutes when you're ahead and want to kill and BYU killed so many games with the ball Tyler Algier a big big part of that but that was another game in which they said okay if we've got to finish the game with the ball let's go do it and they would run Tyler that way and we're really good at it between Coach Roderick, Coach Tuiaki, and Coach Sitake, they truly live the sports cliche that a win is a win. They do not care for style points. They do not care for margin of victory. I do, and fans do. You want to come in here. You mentioned earlier double-digit favorite on the road, and you want to win by 14, 21, you know, 20-plus points. But if it doesn't happen that way, uh, Kalani, Roderick, and Tuiaki really only care about getting the win. So while... That, and, and that's why I think it was such a different tone about UAB. It wasn't just that the game was ugly, it's that the outcome was ugly as well. Uh, so it, coming in here today, I don't think anybody's paying much attention to the spread. I think they've learned the lessons from the past two matchups, and uh, we'll see what happens. Among the ways in which BYU's offense was excellent last year, we talked about the ability to finish off games. Uh, these were some rankings BYU had, and the, the ironic thing is, 
of the ranks I'm, uh, ranks I'm about to give you, the lowest one, that is the one they maybe, quote-unquote, struggle with most, was scoring. Um, they, were, they were in the top 30 in scoring. Scoring is what matters most, but that's where they had the lowest rank was actually in scoring. They were top 25 in pass completion percentage, top 25 in yards per completion, points per play, yards per rush, and red zone scoring. They were top 20 in total offense. They were top 15 on third downs, yards per pass attempt, and pass efficiency. They were top 10 in yards per play. That's a great efficiency margin. Yards are uh, metric is yards per play. TD to INT ratio, turnover margin, and sacks allowed. And then they were top five in red zone TD percentage. So of all those, the lowest one was actually scoring, which um, you know indicates there were a few drives last year that went without points that should have been expected to result in points. And that's where Aaron Roderick, I think, uh, looks at you know the one area to kind of clean things up is on that note, but that's still with a team that was top five in red zone TD percentage. So, uh, you know, it could be a, a few fourth down failures, some missed field goals. Jake was, I think, what, nine for 13 on his field goal tries uh, last year. Uh, but for the most part, I mean, whether it's Jeff Grimes or Aaron Roderick, this offense has been clicking uh, for a number of years in a row right now. And one of the reasons is, well, first of all, they've set up a solid foundation. They don't try and do too much. They know who they are. They know who they are in the run game. They know who they are in the passing game, right? And in the run game, they're a wide zone team. That Everything begins from the wide zone run play, the handoff either from under center or from pistol. And then from there, it's play action, both play action chain movers and play action shots, and then a highly efficient pass, pass run game that is – or sorry – highly efficient drop back pass game that is focused on finding the best matchups and getting uh, uh, your best players matched up against a weakness of your defense. But here's the thing in watching fall camp uh, that I am most uh, excited about or or that this staff is extremely talented at, and it is self-scout. You're going to see throughout the the point of the season, I think the early season, I don't know how much here today, but definitely against Baylor and Oregon, BYU has had a couple of very common schemes. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, you know, divulge what I shouldn't out here. But you're gonna see some plays off those schemes where you're gonna think, oh, here it goes again, right? Thinking it's a familiar play, mm-hmm. and they're going to do an extremely inventive and creative thing off of that that I think is going to. First of all, it's going to cause nightmares for defenses in preparing for BYU. But secondly, I think it's going to produce some big play opportunities on the field. And it, again, it is all just one iteration. They're not trying to reinvent themselves. It's just one iteration off what they've already established that they are great at. BYU and USF in a weather delay here at Raymond James Stadium in Tampa, Florida. The time is 4.32 Eastern time. We were originally told that would be the earliest we could restart, 30 minutes after the scheduled kick. That did not happen. We're now hearing that 4.45, 2.45 in the Mountain Time Zone is our earliest projected kickoff time. But as we say that, uh, the skies have darkened more than they were even uh, 10 minutes ago. Now it's all about uh, where the cells are being taken in the vicinity and uh, when, you know... The official atmospheric relative to lightning clearance is given to get this game finally underway. Let's take another two-minute break. We are talking with you from Raymond James Stadium and wading through the weather here in South Florida. BYU and USF coming up to our network affiliates. And to those listening on the radio, let's take a two-minute break. We're back with you in two from Tampa on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Did you know the average TV commercial break is around three minutes long and that it takes a cup of noodles about three minutes to cook? Your favorite song is probably three minutes long, too. And you get a pressure-filled three minutes to finish your turn in Scrabble? But did you know you can get a rain-repelling, triple-foaming, tire-shining, undercarriage rust-inhibiting car wash in just three minutes? You can, with membership at Quick Quack, home of the three-minute shine. Learn more at DontDriveDirty.com. See you soon. You're listening to BYU Football on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. You're listening to BYU Football on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. It now appears this game will be delayed by at least an hour from its scheduled kickoff time of a 4.02 Eastern, 2.02 Mountain Time. It's interesting that uh, this delay... Is, is kind of par for our broadcast course for the weekend. We've had some weird stuff happen with our crew just getting to Tampa. So uh, two members of our, of our engineering crew, uh, Engineer Michael Wimmer and our broadcast intern Jared Call, were flying to Tampa through Dallas on Thursday. They got to Dallas. Weather prevented them from finishing their trip to Tampa 
and no more flights were able to get them in that day or even scheduled for the next day based on space to get to Tampa. So Michael and Jared decided to uh, call an audible and get in the car and start driving from Dallas to Tampa to get here for the game. And then weather even derailed those plans on the road. They had to overnight in Louisiana before continuing their trip yesterday, and that was a 17-hour drive. Oof. That should have been a flight. And so Michael and Jared were delayed to the point where normally, you know, we use Friday as our setup here at the booth. Well, they weren't going to get here in time to even set up the broadcast booth. And so we sent another engineer, Barry Squires, who's worked on these broadcasts for years and years with me on my flight on Thursday night to get here on the red eye to be able to do setup with the booth uh, in the booth yesterday with the assistance of uh, Clark Jackman from BYU Radio, another engineer. So we've actually had two separate engineering crews try to get to Tampa in separate ways to get this game on the air today. They did an amazing job to get everything set up and ready to go. But then we get to this point, and yet more delays. And that's kind of, again, how this weekend has gone for us. We hope that uh, when we get you know, time for actual you know, snaps and calls and throws and runs, that things work out better for BYU than it has for the broadcast crew and for the game staff on this game day. We are in a weather delay here at Raymond James Stadium in Tampa, Florida. Greg Rubel and Riley Nelson with you. And again, it could still be a while. So we're going to stay with you. We're not going to drop you off to alternate programming. We will stick with you here from Tampa, but no football to bring you yet. If you were tuning in, expecting us to be midway through the first quarter, you're not getting any football, but you haven't missed anything because uh, right before kickoff, in fact, right around 4 o'clock here Eastern time, the weather delay sign came up on the board, and uh, fans were told to, uh, for, to take shelter uh, in a covered area of the stadium. And not everyone is in a covered area. In fact, we haven't seen lightning strikes visible lightning strikes around the stadium. It's, it's in places we can't see that have those assessing the weather in this holding pattern. All right, to the game itself and what we're expecting to see from South Florida. And I say expecting because it's a new OC and it's a new DC and it's a new starting quarterback. And so in those situations, I, I mentioned earlier, Riley, that I'd rather be the team with all the returning coaches and returning starting quarterback than the team breaking in the new guys. What are the benefits of all that novelty if you're USF and the challenges of, you know, calling and getting plays run in a first-time scenario against a really good and nationally ranked team. So the uh, listeners that have been with us all the way since Shep and I were doing the pregame live show, uh, Shep has got a segment where we are featuring uh, a game from the a memorable game from the Independence era. And so today uh, he did the first game, which was against Ole Miss. One thing that's memorable about that is uh, that was also the debut of Brandon Doman as an offensive coordinator. So I was part of that. I was the backup at the time. But as you look at that game uh, to try and give uh, an instance, or at least that I was part of, it did not go super smoothly for us offensively. We won the game 14. BYU won the game 14-13. to 13. But that was with the help of a defensive touchdown by Kyle Van Oy. So we only managed one offensive uh uh, only one offensive touchdown. Now, keep in mind, we were on the road, had a young starting quarterback, uh, but it, it was just very, it was very tough. You look at that, we were able to come away with the win. Uh, and, and you look at the dynamics, had to have very st- uh, stiff defense and special teams, and then we needed, uh, obviously needed some help from the defense to score to, to win that. I think that same recipe is going to hold true for USF. Now, I think that old Miss team that year was, you know, at right around 500, you know, somewhere in the 6-6 six and six range, maybe 5-7 and seven range. They were not as good as this BYU team that USF that is now in that situation of having new coordinators is, is going to face. But I will say this, um, having a new defensive coordinator is different from an offensive coordinator. Oftentimes, a new defensive coordinator, and I, I also experienced this in my time at BYU in 2010, uh, Jaime Hill was the defensive coordinator, and midway through the season was let go, and Coach Mendenhall took over the coordinating and play-calling duties of the defense. Now, Coach Mendenhall it wasn't his first rodeo. He had obviously built his career as that, and as a head coach, it was natural for him to slide over into that spot. But our defense from that point uh, took a significant leap forward. And I say that to mean that with defense, often what, what a new defensive coordinator can bring is a new attitude, a new emphasis on effort and and you know discipline and intensity and if you do all of those things your production there's a direct correlation between your production and your intensity on defense on offense not necessarily because each point has to be coordinated and built upon the other meaning 
if you're going to have a successful pass play, the offensive line has to do their job. The running back has to do his job in protection. The wide receivers have to run routes. Their spacing has to be good. Their timing has to be good with the quarterback. The quarterback has to read the defense. He's got to deliver the ball. Uh, so, uh, for those, so it'll be interesting to see that where it's going to be a significant challenge for USF's offense to overcome the new offensive coordinator. It w- sh- it will be an advantage, or I expect a increased. Uh, a per- I'm an increased performance from the USF defense coming in with the first-time coordinator. He is Riley Nelson. My name is Greg Rubel. You're in a weather delay here in Tampa, Florida. And uh, I I do see now uh, lightning and rainfall as the uh, clouds have uh, darkened. And you can see a storm uh, front passing to the southwest. I think that would be the stadium right now. And so uh, weather's become an issue. We never got underway here in Tampa today. We're currently 40 minutes past our scheduled kickoff time. We expect to be in this holding pattern for a while longer. Our pregame coverage began at noon mountain time. We're almost at 3 o'clock mountain time. During our pregame coverage, you heard a couple of interviews we were going to re-air for you as we are in this holding pattern here in Tampa. Jason Shepard spoke with both BYU's starting quarterback, Jaron Hall, and USF head coach, Jeff Scott. We'll get to Jaron first after I tell you a bit about what Jaron did last year. Jaron put himself in some pretty exclusive company last season. Jaron Hall was one of only four Division I signal callers last year with these numbers. All of these numbers together. 2,500 or more passing yards. A pass efficiency rating of 150 or better. Eight plus yards per attempt. And eight's been a pretty significant uh, long-term plateau for success when you go eight plus YPA. A TD to INT ratio of four to one or better. And on top of all that, 300 or more rushing yards. So you're talking about a big number passing quarterback, an efficient passing quarterback, Uh, Doesn't make a lot of mistakes in terms of the TD-INT ratio, and he can beat you with his legs. All those things together, Jaron was only one of only four quarterbacks to have that collection of stats. And in the lead-up to BYU and USF, our Jason Shepard spoke with BYU starting quarterback, Jaron Hall. I'm having a lot of fun. Um, I think that's the one thing I've learned over the last couple years is just enjoy everything about this. You know, coming to college can be stressful. College sports can be stressful. You know, adapting to... You know the uh, the speed of everything, but being my my fifth year here, just that's my number one focus is having fun, enjoying being here, and everything that you mentioned that all plays role into that. It's it's just fun for me. How crazy is it to think you've been here that long already? It's it's crazy. <laughs> Much longer than I thought I'd be here years ago, but it's uh, <laughs> it's just what my plan was, and I'm 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 loving it. Well, look, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, and I feel like I know you pretty well, and one thing that has always stood out to me about you, look, and I'm not the only one that sees this, it's your ability to kind of handle any situation. You don't look like you get too high. You don't look like you get too low. You just seem to be able to handle whatever is put in front of you. Is that something you've always had, or is that something you've had to learn to do? I think a little bit of both. Just my personality, just very chill, laid back not too over the top. And then also when it comes to the, those situations, specifically with sports, I ain't playing so many different sports growing up. I've just seen a lot of different scenarios, been in a lot of different situations, whether it's football, baseball, basketball. And I just think it's, get, it's given me the most experience in that time. So now carrying it with me to college, I just feel like that's part of who I've become and who I am. Um, and I try to be, you know, I try to love doing that and just making that part of, you know, everything about me, just, just being chill, even kill. One more big picture question, then we'll get into, and it, and it somewhat plays off of what I just asked you. Obviously, being the starting quarterback anywhere is going to be a big deal, and there's going to be a certain amount of prestige that comes with that. Being the starting quarterback at BYU, it's a big deal. How have you handled that? What, what is it like to be the BYU starting quarterback and just going around with that on your shoulders? Growing up here, understanding what BYU is, what it stands for, being a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, all that stuff combined, I think kind of helped prepare me for that. Um, I think kids that are kind of unfamiliar with BYU might be a little different to them when they get here. But for me, it's just been part of my DNA all my life, being a BYU fan, family playing here, watching the Cougs every Saturday, coming to games. Um, yeah, I just think that that's kind of what I expected all my life is to be in this situation. That's what I hope for. And so for me, I just think it just kind of a culmination of preparing for it, living a lifestyle in line with it, what the school stands for, and then, uh, yeah, just enjoying it at the same time. So um, I just see it as an honor to be here, to be in this position. And I know a lot of my teammates, you know, feel the same in the positions they're in here at BYU. 
All right, let's focus on some football here. Season opener, South Florida. Just initial thoughts on taking on this Bulls team in their home stadium. They're a good team. I think uh, a lot of people aren't aware of the changes they made this season. On top of returning as many guys as they did, they've added nine transfers on the defensive side from a lot of great P5 programs. They have a great defensive coordinator. It's very experienced. And so I just think that for us, it's a matter of respecting the game respecting the heck out of these guys because we know they're going to be a well-prepared team and then just going and executing. So I'm very excited. I'm ready to finally play a game. It's been a while for me. Um, I'm just ready to get back out in the field and, and enjoy you know, playing and putting on a show for our fans. You did not get to play in the game in Provo last year against this team. How much of last year's film can you watch with so many new guys on their defense? Or, or is it mostly you look at the scheme and then you worry about the individual players after? Yeah, a little bit of everything. Some from last year, some from the defensive coordinator and his experience. So it's just a lot of different stuff. And that's the tough thing about a, a game at the first of the year is when you have you know, new players, new coaching staff, new coordinators. It's hard to tell exactly what they're going to do. You know, last year we had an experience with Arizona's defensive coordinator, and it didn't turn out to be what we thought. And so it's first game of the season. A lot of times can be adapting on the fly, adapting at halftime. Um, But for now, we just focus on what we're given, what we have to to go off of from last year and years in the past, and then uh, just hope that we can execute our, you know, our plays better than they, they execute theirs, and that's what football comes down to. You mentioned the production that they have coming back on both sides of the ball. Uh, they're, I believe, fifth in terms of returning production. You guys are number two in the country. My question to you regarding that is, how do you hope or want that to translate into the game with this much production coming back? Yeah, you would hope that it just starts and translates into a fast start offensively, defensively, and all around the ball. I just think with fall camp, having as many reps we have against our defense, how good they are, the defense against our offense, everyone's experience, you'd hope that that allow us to play free on the first game. Um, just to head into that stadium, knowing that we put in the work, you know, this last month and a half and all summer, there's no need to stress about a first game, no need to, to, to cram and try to do more than we need to, and really just relax, have fun, and just trust in, in the process, trust in our preparation. And I think that's where experience can tend to help in the first game of the year. Well, and then experience also, it seems like with a number of guys coming back and you knowing what you have around you, confidence level should be through the roof heading into this. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, definitely. I think, I think but you know, even with, with experience, I think confidence more comes from your preparation. You know, preparation breeds confidence. And so I know the guys are in my room with me on the offense. I know guys have been preparing. You know, I've been trying to prepare the best I can. I think from that preparation all together, seeing each other doing it, watching film together, I think that ultimately is what's going to give us the most confidence on Saturday to know that, hey, the guy next to me knows what he's doing because I was there preparing with him for the last month and a half during fall camp and during the summer. And so I think just preparation we put in is what will give us the most confidence. What excites you most about this offense and what you bring to the table heading into game one? I don't think there's anything I'm not excited about. I just think we're very well balanced on every asset of, of the offense, honestly. Um, I wish I could give you one thing I'm most excited about, but I'm just, I'm just excited to see all 11 of us out there rolling and doing our thing. All right, let's wrap things up with the final four questions. Uh, since you are the first guest of the season, you get the brand new batch of four questions. So we'll start off with these. All right, first question. Your favorite class at BYU is what? Tom Galilee's sports psychology class. Why is that your favorite class? Uh, it's the first one that came to my mind, and so it must be very important. Um, and I think the mental side of sports is something that should be hit just as much as the physical side. Very nice. All right, what is better, the book or the movie? The movie. I, I've, I've never felt closer to you. I, I, there's so many people that, oh, the, the, movie, the movie was okay, but the book was oh, better. Yeah. I'm like, nah, I can't read that book in two hours. Exactly, exactly. I, you know, a lot of people love the details of books, and they hate when these movie producers try to cram it in. But what do you expect from them? You know, no one's got the time to, to draw out a book that's, you know, a thousand pages long into nine movies. It's just, you know, the world just moves too quickly. We've got to get, we've got to get it in, you know, not enough time. I knew we were very much the same. Okay, if you inherited a million dollars today, first thing you're going to buy is what? A new set of golf clubs and my wife a new car. There was no hesitation there. Put the wife's car first, actually. I'll say the wife's car and then my golf club. That sounded wrong. I, I like the way you're thinking. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, last question. What will you remember most about the era of independence? Uh, probably our win against Utah. Probably my, uh, my number one just because I was a part of it, obviously. Breaking the streak. Yeah, it was a it was a good night. That's probably be my highlight of the Independence era, personally, selfishly. 
I think there's probably a lot of people that are going to agree with you, myself included. Uh, Jaron, thank you so much. Uh, it is a pleasure to always uh, get a chance to talk with you, and good luck against South Florida. Thank you very much. All right, to our Jason Shepard with BYU starting quarterback Jaron Hall. We're in Tampa, Florida, Raymond James Stadium, where the rain has now begun to fall. We had the clouds, we had the thunder and the lightning and the delay, and now the rain to go along with the atmospherics. And so it's another delay or a, an extended delay, at least 30 more minutes from the last lightning strike till we'll kick it off. BYU defensive coordinator Elisa Tuiaki is located in the booth adjacent to ours here at Raymond James Stadium. He and his fellow coaches taking a break as they wait through this. Uh, Coach E, thanks for jumping into our booth for a minute. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. All right, so you, you, you expected this could be a possibility just based on the weather the last couple of days. You knew it was happening late afternoon, evening. So what was the plan going into today in the event of a delay? Yeah, I mean, we were expecting it, um, you know, ready to start the game when, 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 uh, when the game was called. But then uh, with this, you know, you just get the players back in, make sure they're hydrated and, and rested and, and getting a little something in their stomachs as well, just – you never know how long these things last, but you just you got to go and just kind of wait it out. Everyone's mentally fired up and ready to go at 2 and suddenly you're not. Uh, it's one thing for you guys to have to hit the reset button. What's it like for the guys, do you think, down in the room right now? Yeah, you know, obviously it's not the ideal situation, it's, uh, but uh, <clears throat> it's just something that you deal with. And so, um, you know, they'll, they'll go and take their pads off and just uh, relax for a little bit. I'm sure they're watching and keeping up with other games as they're waiting for this delay. But, uh, you know, when... When the delay is done and, and we're ready to roll, they'll they'll get back into the mindset that we need and get back out, get warmed up, and, re- and, and go. Did you as a coaching group in the booth next to us all decide to stay up here? Are some up, some down right now? Or Yeah, I, mean, I think we're all up here. There's not really okay. anything that we can do down there. This uh, this kind of timing just really turns over to the, uh, the strength staff. The strength staff is just... Uh, you know the nutritionists, just all the guys, sports scientists. They're, they're, th- this is their time. This is their game time where they make sure that they can adjust to what we need. Just make sure that guys are are ready when we do start. Coach, yesterday there was a pretty big rainstorm. I, it's, I've been listening to all the weather folks say that could happen at any moment, at some time during this game. If that does, does that present an advantage for your defense or at a disadvantage based off what you've seen from South Florida and their offensive style? I, th- I think any time there's, there's, there's rain, it's an advantage to the defense just because you'd expect a little bit more run, um, l- you know, a little bit more predictable because you don't want uh, – offenses normally don't, don't come out and sling it, right, when, when it's uh, rainy and so – um, a little bit more predictable as far as just what we're expecting from them. Now, obviously, they still can pass, and, and uh, I mean, you've played in it, right? D- depending on how hard the rain's coming down and how, how, how well your, your uh, you know, staff is keeping the, the balls dry and all that stuff, and it just comes into play as far as what we get. But I think they are a little bit more um, predictable if it starts to really pour. Mm. Coach, in Coach Sitake's pregame interview with Greg, there was uh, mention about the corners, and it could might maybe be cornerback by committee. Talk about two things. One, uh, obviously the depth you've been able to build at that position, which is not one where, his, where BYU has been historically deep. And then two, uh, is cornerback a position where – uh, players like need to get in a rhythm and, and really need a lot of reps, or is it one where you can keep guys fresh and expect a high level of play, even if they're in and out of the game every couple of plays? Yeah, you know, it, I think uh, it really just depends on on uh, the, the corners that you have and how how, how much experience they have. And so, uh, you know, the first the first four corners we've got, the, uh, we see them all as co starters and plan on just rotating them, keeping them keeping them fresh. Um, you've got D'Lo and, and uh, uh, Caleb starting it off, but we'll, we plan on using Gabe and, and Jacob as well. And, um, you know, didn't know if it was going to be really, really hot and, and uh, humid. And just we wanted to make sure that those guys were ready to rotate. And so uh, felt like it, with at least those first two groups, we could play the, the type of defense we wanted uh, without any kind of drop off at the cornerback position. And that's normally, at least for me, the, the, the first thing that really changes uh, your mindset as far as just what coverages you want to play and all that. And so having those corners, um, feeling good about having a two deep that you could play all game was uh, was really, I, I, I felt good about coming what, out of camp. What's been the key to getting those dudes here to Provo? You know, it's just a fit. <clears throat> uh, you know, those, those those type of kids are out there. The, we're, we're, you know, obviously for us, just through the years, we've talked about kids that, are, that, that fit the mold, you know, that uh, can make it at BYU, that are looking for this. I mean, uh, th- we've recruited a lot of other kids that, just felt like you know what maybe they weren't necessarily looking for the advantages that BYU gives, but these kids were. You know, it's a it's a place where you can play big time football, but focus uh, you know on on your classes, focus on becoming a professional football player, and and uh, you know everything about these kids fit that. And so 
we'll, we'll, we'll continue to recruit like that. feel like the, all the young kids that we brought in, all the young corners, I mean, they just fit that mold as well. Kids that were serious about their education, serious about just playing ball and, and uh, making this their profession. And, uh, you know, BYU offers that. And so I uh, really like the, the group of kids that we have. We've got tall, tall, fast, rangy corners that can, they can play that we feel are great fits for our program. Greg Grubel and Riley Nelson visiting with BYU defensive coordinator Eli Tuiaki during this weather delay here in Tampa. Coach E, generous enough to spend a few minutes with us here as we wait through this uh, the, this uh, this delay till restart. It was scheduled to start at uh, 4.02 Eastern time. We're almost at uh, 5 o'clock Eastern time, so at least a one-hour delay and then some for BYU and USF. How would you characterize your base scheme this year? What would you say you run? Base scheme, that's a, that's a great question. Because it's, it's, it's so multiple still, right? <laughs> it's its always been really, really multiple. And, um, you know, I was interviewing with the, uh, the, the folks that were going to end up doing our game today. Um, and it's its really the first time that anybody said, you guys are base four down, and then you dabble in three down. And none of them have ever really, uh, you know, through the years recognized that. We've always been a four down team yeah. and dabble in three down. And I think it just, uh, oh, the rain's coming down. Yeah. It, it really just depends on on the, the, the team that you're facing, uh, personnel groupings. Just you know, we're trying to make things a little bit more difficult for the quarterback as well as just for the 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 offense to execute whatever scheme they're coming in with. You know, college there's just so many different schemes, and um, not, we, you know, we, we obviously feel like we need to have some kind of identity, and that really exists in coverages hmm. uh, for us. Um, you know, there, there's a the idea that you have to play some sort of man coverage, which is either man or quarters, and, and, and we do that. We do both, really. But then outside of that, it's <clears throat> the multiplicity for us exists in the front. There's a lot of different fronts that we run. There's a lot of different uh, things that we do that are, that are uh, you know, specific to us. But with coverages, I think, I think that's probably where our staple is. We've done a lot of different things up front through the years, but we've been pretty, uh, you know, pretty cemented as far as just what coverages we feel like we can we can run here at BYU. You're looking at my defensive spotting board in front of you and and you may go deeper than this, but I've got ten D linemen listed right now. Uh, John Nelson, Lorenzo Fawatea, Caden Hawes, Tyler Batty, Blake Mangelson, Earl Tuioti Mariner, Gabe Summers, Fisher Jackson, Alden Tofa, and Logan Latui. You yeah. may go deeper than ten, but that's a pretty good top ten for you right now, isn't it? That is, that is, and I think I think we probably will end up going deep, and probably deeper at the tackles than we will at the ends. I think, you know, those uh, four or five ends will probably probably get to play, maybe six. I don't know, but I think uh, we definitely will be playing the three sets of tackles. So Bruce uh, Bruce Mitchell and Josh Larson are the two, next two up, and then we've got another set of tackles that I feel good about as well. But those guys probably won't get as many reps. Now, not every coach goes this deep with their defensive line. Why is it the, 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 the way you like to go? It's, you know, just through the years, I feel like it's, it's such a physical position. It's, uh, you know, when you're playing D-line, it's a little bit different from offensive line where you don't know where you're going. You're on the receiving end as far as just people firing out. And so you've got to be uh, big, physical. But also, I think if you have guys that are capable, I mean, obviously, if, if you don't have guys that are capable then you just play who's capable but i feel like we're starting to get to a point where we have capable tackles that can give us snaps that i feel comfortable about putting into game about doing their assignment correctly about you know being physical enough and all those things and when you do that you can play your whole season without losing anybody and if you do lose somebody you have guys that come in with a little bit of experience we'd like to keep the drop off to a minimum as far as just you know if you lose a guy then the next guy comes in with absolutely no experience but that just that's a it's a tough situation to be in as a as a defensive line and so getting all these young guys experience um you know keeping them all kind of fairly close where the drop off isn't too big is is uh, i think is an advantage for us depending on how you choose to start the game personnel wise you could have tyler batty at one end and john nelson at the other everyone knows tyler batty john nelson's a name that people are still maybe getting used to or familiar with what, what, what do you like about john and, and how did he get the position he did with you yeah so john uh john is a big physical uh defensive end i mean he's he's uh one that can that can move in and play d tackle as well but he has the twitch to play outside and so um really loved him in the recruiting process felt like he was just our kind of guy you know his his mom was actually working um in uh, in academics for us when, when we first came in 2016 and so he was a byu kid through and through his mom played basketball i believe basketball or volleyball at BYU. and so he's just he was a great fit for us but he brings so many things as far as just uh, his his ability and just he played a lot for us last year 
um, as a freshman, and now he's coming into his sophomore year, and he's just got so much more experience. And this offseason for him, the way he's playing in fall camp was just really, really impressive. So I think through the years, people, well, through through the season, people will start to really recognize him as well. As you've got you've got Tyler Batty, who I think is playing at a really high level, but you've also got John Nelson that's playing playing at a pretty high level as well. Let's talk about the safeties, I, which is, I think, uh, the only group we haven't really gone over or been mentioned much with you. Malik Moore is kind of the leader in the room. And then talk about some of the other younger guys who are going to get a chance to show what they can do on the field. Yeah, yeah. You know, Malik and Ammon have, have had a solid fall camp. They, they bring a lot of experience. Malik obviously has just, just done so many things for us through the years. And, um, you know, switching switching Micah Harper over from corner to safety has been huge for us. He's, a, he's playing a position where we expect him to do a lot of, of, of covering, man coverage and all that stuff. And so he's got uh, his, his skill sets needed there. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we feel comfortable about those guys getting in. And obviously Hayden Livingston has played for us through the years. And so the 2D there is good. Um, a lot of youth behind those guys, and, and those guys are still kind of catching up, learning it. There's a there's a lot lot to learn at the safety position, just with the different coverages and things that we do. But we feel good about those guys, and uh, certainly feel good about the, the the first group for sure. Quick word about the backers: Riley, too, uh, Bywater, Peely, Tooley, and and Wilgar, kind of a top four, depending on who's on the field at any given time. You can see three or four, and then maybe it's uh, Jackson and Pepe next two up, maybe, or or do you, you see it differently? Yep, yep. The, those those will be the next two up, and so you know, like you mentioned, you've got Keenan, Max, and Ben, um, and Peyton, right? And then, yep. and then uh, yep, Jackson and and uh, Pepe come in after well, that. Well, man, if, if, if that group uh, stays in, in, in full health, that's a really solid bunch of players for you. We're, we're going to need them, too. Those, uh, we saw the drop-off when we ended up missing Keenan and Peyton, and so um, feel feel good about if we can keep those guys rotating and, and use put snaps on them, then I think I think we'll be in a pretty good spot. Okay, DC. Uh, we need Eli's to start the game now. It's yeah. dumping. <laughs> yeah. We need to start the game yeah. right now. Describe, <laughs> describe what you're seeing right now here at the stadium. I'm, I'm seeing a def- defensive advantage is what I'm seeing. <laughs> yeah. the, the rain is coming down hard. The ball will be slippery. It just makes for some good takeaway opportunities, and we, we need to get this thing moving. All right, uh, Eliza, thank you very much for taking a minute and uh, spending some time with us. We're going to let you get back to your boys, and hopefully we get this game underway uh, shortly. Appreciate you taking the time. All right, thank you. All right, that is defensive coordinator Eliza Tuiaki joining us here in the broadcast booth at Raymond James Stadium, where, yes, it is now a torrential downpour. And this is what we've seen the last couple of days here in Tampa. Late afternoon, the sky's open, and it has just been dumping. And it's not so much thunder and lightning right now as it is the rainfall that followed the earlier darkened skies and lightning delay. But if I look to the sky to my right, I see patches of blue, and it's like the cell might be running through. And if that's the case, if we do get this thing underway in the next half hour or so, we're already in an hour-plus weather delay here at Raymond James Stadium in Tampa, Florida. Greg Grubel, Riley Nelson. Mitchell Juergens is somewhere in the stadium. He may still be in the tunnel. In fact, maybe it's a good time to check in and see if uh, Mitch is still with us on the headset and can get a word into us just to let us know about uh, where he is and what he's seeing and feeling. Yeah, can you hear me, Greg? We got you, Mitch. Yeah, you got me. Um, so I'm in the tunnel. It's uh, yeah, not, still nothing going on. None of the players are coming out of the locker room. Um, just a bunch of people gathered kind of now just uh, astounded by how heavy this downpour is uh, because it's coming. It's kind of leaking through the through the stadium right now so you're finding your finding your dry pockets to stay dry but um yeah we're just waiting to see what happens mitchell jurgens down in the uh, locker room area tunnel area both teams were on the field we were about to get this game underway we were probably two minutes from kickoff when they put the weather delay in effect and it's been going for an hour but again skies lightning uh to the south and it could be that uh this allows us to play in the next hour or so, but that's all speculation is every time there's a lightning strike within, I believe, six miles of the stadium, uh, there's a reset of the lightning clock. Let's take another two-minute break. We'll take a break for two. So a note to our network stations and affiliates, we're going to break for two minutes as our extended pregame coverage continues with this game and a weather delay in Tampa on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Let's head back to the Built Bar broadcast booth and join the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. And the lightning clock has been reset again just now. At least another 30 more minutes of delay here in Tampa, Florida, before BYU and USF can play football. The rain continues to fall. It's lightning a little bit. The skies are also lightning a little bit. But the lightning clock continues to reset. This game will be delayed by at least 90 minutes from its scheduled start time. 
So these are the guidelines from the NCAA regarding lightning and lightning safety. And I'm quoting now from the lightning policy uh, at NCAA.org. Lightning awareness should be heightened at the first flash of lightning, clap of thunder, and or other signs of an impending storm, such as increasing winds or darkening skies, no matter how far away. As a minimum, lightning safety experts strongly recommend that by the time the weather monitor observes 30 seconds between seeing lightning and hearing its associated thunder, or by the time the leading edge of the storm is within six miles of the venue, all individuals should have left the athletic site, or in this case the seating area, and be within a safer, structu- a safer structure or location. And so that's the 30-second uh, flash-to-bang ratio that you hear about. And then it says to resume athletic ati- activities, athletics activities, lightning safety experts recommend waiting 30 minutes after both the last sound of thunder and after the last flash of lightning is at least six miles away and moving away from the venue. If lightning is seen without hearing thunder, lightning may be out of range and therefore less likely to be a significant threat. At night, be aware, it says, that lightning can be visible at a much greater distance than during the day as clouds are being lit from the inside by lightning. The greater distance may mean that the lightning is no longer a significant threat. At night, use both the sound of thunder and seeing the lightning channel itself to decide on when to reset the 30-minute return-to-play clock before resuming outdoor athletics activities. And so, as it's been determined that every lightning strike has been within at least six miles of the stadium, every strike has necessitated a new 30-minute reset of the lightning clock. And that happened just moments ago. So, 336 Mountain, 536 Eastern is the earliest we think play could resume. But, uh, Riley, as we talk with you from Raymond James Stadium, we do see... Uh, the skies to our right, uh, lightning as the storm pushes from right to left, and it gives us at least uh, you know some encouraging hopes. Yeah, and I got to imagine the field here as we're looking up uh, at the tunnels. There are pools of water. That's how heavy the rain has been. And at a point when we had Coach Tuiaki on with us, like it was difficult to see. It was like the rain was so thick; it was difficult to see the opposite sideline. So. Yeah, I mean, at whatever point the lightning is going to clear, it's going to clear. But it will not be without its impact on the game, not just in the form of a delay. But this field is getting soaked to the point that in the corners of it, it's pooled. As I said, I'm sure, obviously, this is nothing new to the residents of Tampa or the people familiar with this part of the country. I'm sure the field has great drainage. Uh, This is a pro stadium, a pro facility, so I'm sure they've taken every precaution to be able to absorb or handle this amount of water. Uh, But it's going to be wet. It's going to be slippery, and we'll see what impact that has on the game. The storm is moving uh, from the southeast to the northwest, and so when we say to our right, that's the south or southeast, and then it's moving uh, from right to left uh, to the northwest. And and on the radar map I'm looking at, and many of you have... Uh, weather apps with good radar, uh, you can see that behind this uh, belt of storms is a pretty wide open path of land that could allow us to get this game started and hopefully completed. We are sitting at 510 Eastern Time, 310 Mountain Time Zone, an hour and eight minutes after the scheduled kickoff time for BYU and South Florida, and we remain in a weather delay. And again, we've already had numerous 30-minute restarts of the lightning clock. Riley? I was just going to say, suggest to fans out there, keep us obviously in your ear. But uh, if you're by a television set, you can do some scouting. I know that's what Coach Tuiaki and the other staff are doing. You've got Oregon, who's an opponent in two weeks that's on right now. They're taking a beating at the hands of Georgia. And then uh, you've got Arkansas playing Cincinnati, who's a a good opponent. Both those games are on TV. Um, And uh, I just thought it was a fun note that the the, the coaches are not just idly passing the time. They are already beginning their scouting of opponents that BYU faces later in the schedule this year. BYU's next week opponent doesn't have a very tough challenge tonight. Uh, Baylor takes on Albany in Waco. And that'll be a 5 o'clock mountain time kick, 7 o'clock here in the Eastern time zone, 6 o'clock in Waco. That game will be on ESPN Plus. Albany and Baylor. So Baylor uh, expected to pick up its season opening win. Baylor will be ranked. BYU with a win today would be ranked. You see ranked versus ranked Big 12 teams next week if both teams win their games today. That's pretty cool. It really exciting. And I just... Look, I, as we saw with the University of Texas, when those Texas boys come up to the high mountain desert of Provo and Utah, it's 
they struggle. They, I, I, I mean, obviously we're going to have a lot of time leading up to the game to look at all the stats and things like that. But as I remember that game last last year in Waco, BYU was right there kind of punch for punch. And late in the second half, they uh, Baylor was able to get a stop with BYU backed up, score, and kind of widen the gap there. Obviously it ended up being a 10-point defeat for BYU. But I think that between the home field advantage, between BYU returning so many starters, uh, the gap is definitely going to close, and BYU has a tremendous opportunity in week two of this 2022 season. Obviously, look, we're we're not forecasting, or, or sorry, we're not uh, we're not looking past USF. But give us a break here, folks. We're <laughs> over an hour into a rain delay, and we need something to talk about, something to fill the air. But it can, if BYU can defeat in week two the defending Big 12 champ, that sends a message. Uh, not only the country in terms of ranking and what they can be for this 2022 season, but to the rest of the Big 12 as BYU enters the conference next year. Greg Grubel, Riley Nelson here in the broadcast booth. Mitchell Juergens down at the field level. And we've been uh, fortunate enough to uh, visit with BYU defensive coordinator Elisa Tuiaki during this lengthy weather delay. We'll see if any other coaches have the hankering to come and pop on the headset. Again, uh, when the coaches get into pregame or game mode, uh, that's, it's unusual that they would actually take the time to do that. So we're grateful that Coach E did that with us. We'll see if anybody else is able to take us up on the offer to spend a few minutes with us here uh, in the booth. We'll see if anybody pops in either way. Riley and I have you covered. And uh, we also will hear from, uh, after this next break, we're going to take momentarily, we'll hear from Jeff Scott, who's the head coach of the South Florida Bulls. Coach Scott in his third year, and he's struggling to gain traction here in Tampa. His record is 3-18 and through two seasons, but only 1-18 and against FBS opponents. So his uh, two of his three wins are against the Citadel and Florida A&M, two FCS teams. His only, his only uh, FBS win in two seasons was Temple uh, last year. And so, uh, again, trying to turn a corner and having a tough... And he's a coach with a great pedigree. He was the OC at Clemson. It hasn't gotten it going yet here. And uh, so what has he done? He's gone out and loaded up with a bunch of high-level transfers. There are 30 four-year transfers on this roster. And, uh, and, and he's just trying to get himself uh, as quickly up to speed as possible with 22 FBS transfers on the current roster, 19 P5s. So he's gone after people, and he included is Gary Bohannon, which brings us back to the Baylor game. You brought up BYU and Baylor next week and how that could be an intriguing rank matchup. We talked about that. Last year's game against Baylor, there was a bit of an overreaction, Riley, I think, to, oh, here's the gap between Big 12 and BYU. Um, and, you know, because there, there was some notion that, that Baylor actually beat BYU by a wider margin than the score. If you drill down a little bit more, I don't think there was I that think much. it's the opposite. You thought it was closer than the yes. final score. Indicated. There wasn't that great a gulf, maybe, between the two teams, but there was a, a distinct impression that you know, by racking up 300-plus yards on the ground, um, that day they showed that, that you know, they, they won the game in the trenches and that BYU had some work to do in that respect. Would you agree with that notion? I, I would, but also it's an unfamiliar opponent. BYU had, had they never played Baylor? Well, they hadn't played Baylor in the recent history. Yeah, right? it was 1984. To, yeah, right. So, so first of all, you're that. And it's a day game in Texas. Like, that's... I, that has to, home field advantage has to account for something. Like it's not just something we like to talk about. It's something that's very real. It's something that anybody who's played the game knows about. It's something that the people who make it their business in the world of sports betting give. You know, home field advantage counts for at least three or four, four points in the in throughout the course of a ball game as you look at that industry and how they wait for it. And I, I, you know, I just didn't think. I thought that the ten point. I thought that the gap was less was lesser than the 10-point margin of victory uh, demonstrated by Baylor last year. And that's why I'm so excited to get the Baylor Bears up in the altitude and in Lavelle Edwards Stadium to see what can happen. And conversely, BYU's offensive line this year should feel like it's equipped to put up some pretty significant run numbers this year, regardless of opponent. Uh, I, I couldn't be more thrilled than I am to see as many starts back on the offensive line for BYU. That noted... The FBS team with the most combined returning offensive line starts in the country is South Florida. Mm. USF has more offensive line starts back on its roster than any team in the FBS. Now, you could argue to what effect. They've been a struggling team. That said, they at least have the notion of continuity that BYU hopes to exploit on its end with Freeland and Barrington and Barrington and pay LaChance Suamataya, although he's not 
part of continuity. He's a remarkable talent at right tackle. And then Joe Tukuafu, Braden Kine becomes your eighth guy. So those were eight offensive linemen to play five spots. At least seven will see rotation time today. And not every O-line coach says that's going to be our game plan. Most O-line coaches say these are our five, and barring injury, that's our chemistry group, and we're going to keep them together. BYU such that Campbell Barrington and Joe Tukuafu should expect to play today at right guard and a right, right tackle and right guard, respectively. And Tukuafu can also shift with Connor Pay at center. So uh, Coach Funk feels he's got at least seven guys to play the 5 line spots. Yeah, I think uh, you mentioned USFs. Everyone just automatically assumes that returning starters is a is an automatic positive thing. That's not necessarily the case. It's dependent upon previous production and then also how far are they from their ceiling or how much more potential do they have as a player. Blake Freeland is one who's garnered a lot of preseason attention, uh, obviously be- for two reasons. One, because he played very well last year, but two, he looks he looks significantly different. His, his body has matured. There was he He was able to be extremely productive last year, even with you know some pretty obvious technical dif- uh, technical deficiencies in his in his mastery of his footwork and position uh, technique so when you look at things like that you get encouraged about what's coming back the next year and i think BYU even uh, or you know USF uh, USF i haven't dug in and and done the full blown scouting report on their offensive line they're optimistic about their guys so i expect that'll be a position of strength to them but in, in, in terms of BYU uh, this uh, offensive line, uh, of course, it, while you feel comfortable with the depth and you like the rotation, that's great. You do not, uh, b- beyond that, I think they get back into the situation where they're a little bit inexperienced and where, uh, you know, it might uh, it might impact the p- production of the offense. So you hope that all seven of those guys stay healthy. You hope that the rotation increases their chances of staying healthy over the entirety of the season. And if that can happen, uh, I think Jaron and crew should take care of the rest And it should be a pretty productive offensive year uh, this year for BYU. A word about the new guy, Kingsley Suamataia. 6'6", 325 from Orem, Utah. And he was at University of Oregon and uh, transferred to BYU from Oregon. He played in one game during a redshirt season last year. So what about a guy who got into one game at the FBS level makes BYU so excited? Well, maybe all you need to know is what Aaron Roderick said about Kingsley Suamataia. And that is, he thinks he's the most athletic player he's seen play the tackle position as a college coach. Aaron's been around a bit, and he's been a part of really good offensive lines here and at Utah. And for him to say that about Kingsley is, I think, all you need to know. Um, He thinks he's a unique, um, kind of a -a one-of-a-kind talent for how fast he is and how big he is at that right tackle spot. He stood out to me in the scrimmages and practices that I was able to go to through fall campus also being the most physical like he was seeking contact he he wasn't just uh i specifically remember a play uh it was actually it was so it was the ones versus the scout team and he did a double team and it wasn't just enough he, he didn't normally in a double team you're trying to as the tackle especially because you're on the outside of that of the guy over the guard you're just trying to nudge him so that the guard can get him one-on-one then you can climb to the linebacker he wasn't content to just nudge him so that Harris Lachance could was able to get his reach block on the tackle he knocked the dude to the ground and then goes and pancakes the linebacker right and this wasn't just one play this continued to happen over and over again obviously his athletic ability and his size gets gives him the ability to do so, but that also speaks to his mindset as an offensive lineman that he doesn't just want to do the bare minimum at his position. He wants to dominate it, and that's exciting. It's also contagious across those front five players. If you get all of your front five offensive linemen playing like that, look out opposing defenses. Well, before we um, tell you what's happening in the stands, I'll tell you that Kingsley Suamataia is BYU's heaviest offensive lineman among the top eight at 325 pounds. Here's your starting five across the front. Freeland, 6'8", 305. Clark Barrington, 6'6", 305. Connor Pace, 6'5", 312. Harris Lachance, 6'8", 310. Kingsley Suamataia, 6'6", 325. Kime comes off the bench at 6'8", 305. Tukuafu at 6'4", 300. And the lightest of them all is Campbell Barrington, who does not look small, at 6'6", 295. That is your group. Can I just tell you how grateful I am for the likes of Russell Wilson, Kyler Murray, 
Heck, even Jaron Halls. Back when I played, which, uh, you know, I was in high school 15, 17 years ago, obviously finished my college career. That would have been a thing when you've got Jaron Hall, who's a quarterback, who I think they've listed maybe a little bit generously at 6'1", <laughs> but they'd say, oh, my goodness, his shortest his shortest guy in front of him six six. How's he ever going to be able to see? Look, a- athletes and quarterbacks, they find a way to be productive, A. B, it's simple as a, an offensive coordinator saying, let's just put him in the pistol or in the gun. Give him, create that space behind his offensive line and create lanes of vision and throwing lanes for him to be able to complete passes and not uh, not be worried or overreact to the fact that you've got a quarterback who's about six feet and the five guys standing in front of him are more than six inches taller than him. As Riley was talking, you may have heard the crowd begin to make noise here at Tampa because the fans have been released into the stands, and the plan is now to release teams onto the field at 525 Eastern Time, 325 in the Mountain Time Zone. That is three minutes away. That is excellent news. Let's do this. Let's take a two-minute break. We'll come back. When we come back, we'll hear Jason Shepard's conversation with USF head football coach Jeff Scott. And then we'll be even closer to kicking things off here in Tampa. We're at Raymond James Stadium in Tampa, Florida. The weather delay sign has been taken off the stadium end boards. So the weather delay is no longer in effect. The fans are back in the stands. The teams will be on the field momentarily. And we're breaking for two on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now back to Riley Nelson and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel, on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Well, we are riding this thing out. As we went to break a moment ago, I told you about the good news, which was that fans were back in the stands and that we were told teams were about to be released onto the field. And then another lightning strike, which means another 30-minute reset of the lightning clock, and we're not as close to restarting as we thought we were just even two minutes ago. So the fans have not been pulled out of the seats as they were during the first delay, and in fact... The weather delay screen is still not back up here at Raymond James Stadium. It was taken off moments ago. But we did just hear that there was a lightning strike and that another reset had been warranted. Now, whether that becomes official with the delay going on the stadium and board screens or not, I don't know. And whether or not fans will be asked to leave the stands again, I don't know. But we may not be as on the cusp as we were a moment ago, maybe Riley, from kicking things off. And even if they were to get you know the pregame routine going, briskly after this last delay uh, you're going to be looking at at least a two hour delay to the start of this game you can tell that the stadium crew has dealt with this before we've been entertained by a playlist of Umbrella by Rihanna I Can't Stand the Rain by Missy Elliott most recently they had Millie Vanilli Blame It on the Rain playing so the folks here in Tampa are used to rain delays so much so they have a stadium playlist that they're playing over the loudspeaker to keep the uh, to keep the fans entertained this is, uh, extre- from a player standpoint, it's extremely frustrating because uh, you you need you only have so you only have energy for so many a- activations, and by that it's a it's a two pronged activation. You need a physical activation, you need a mental activation, and while mental activation you might not think about um, you know expending a lot of energy, but it does. You got to get locked in, you got to get concentrated, and you got to get. Physi- you got to get mentally prepared for the physical demands that are going to be placed upon you for, for 60 minutes. So uh, Coach Tuiaki talked about making sure these guys get stuff in their stomachs. I'm not so much worried about warm and cold muscles. I, we, we did One thing that is good is it looks like the temperature has dropped to about 80 degrees and it's going to stay there or below for the rest of the night. So that should be good by way of dehydration and cramping for BYU. Uh, but hopefully they get these guys some energy and then they've got the mental fortitude to be able to stay up and activated after this little false start that we've had after an hour of waiting already. All right, we're going to hear momentarily from uh, USF head coach Jeff Scott. He had a conversation with our Jason Shepard. You heard that hours ago. It feels feels like during our, our Cougar pregame live program, we'll hear more from Jeff Scott and that interview again shortly. Another uh, t- tidbit or two about Coach Scott. I mentioned his, uh, his seasons as the offensive coordinator at Clemson. Now in his third season as the head coach at USF. And I gave you the number of transfers he's brought in. Uh, he is the youngest coach in the American Athletic Conference. He was also a three-year wide receiver at Clemson. A wide receivers coach there for seven years before becoming the offensive coordinator for five years. His son is named Hunter. 
for Clemson wide receiver, now Las Vegas Raider, Raiders wide receiver Hunter Renfro. He coached in the 2016 national title game in Tampa with Hunter Renfro on that team. Under Jeff Scott, USF is 0-6 against top 25 teams. BYU comes in to tonight, ranked number 25. I note that the USF football team is, uh, is it masked in the tunnel there? That's just the band. The band is now filing back out of the stands and into the tunnel, so that could be a sign that we're going to enter official delay territory again. Either way, teams have not left the tunnels and not been taken uh, and have not taken the field. It was probably 10 minutes ago that we were told we were three minutes away from the teams being taken to the field, but since there had been another lightning strike, and that put us in our latest weather delay. Some more notes about Jeff Scott before the interview with Jason Shepard. His teams have not won a lot of games. They're 3-18, and and they rarely play from in front. His teams are 0-12, trailing after the first quarter, 0-11, trailing at half, 0-13, trailing after the third quarter. They just don't come back to win games. They don't win games in general, but they just don't find themselves playing with leads. And BYU under Kalani Sitake is an excellent team when playing with the lead. In fact, BYU is among the best front-running teams you're going to find. If BYU can take a lead, there's a really good chance BYU is going to win the game. Last year, BYU went 9-0, leading or tied at the break, and then lost three of their four games when they were trailing at halftime. And under Kalani all-time, when BYU just leads at halftime, like just half the battle is getting to the break with the lead, BYU is 40-6 when they have a halftime lead. And, And the thing is, the numbers mean a lot more for BYU than they do for BYU's opponents. Well, you could argue, well, everybody, you know, wins most of their games when they are the team, you know, leading at halftime or scoring early or things like that. But it's not exactly that way. It it means much more to BYU than it is meant to the opposition. And we could use the, um, the drawing first blood number, for example. When BYU just scores first, as long as BYU is the first team to take a lead, BYU is 29 and 7. 81% 81% win rate when they just score first. When the opponent scores first, it's only a 54% win rate for them. So it means much more that BYU get on top than its opponent get on top in terms of the end success. And so the Cougars have proven to be fantastic front runners in the Kalani Sitake era. And front running has not been a strength of Jeff Scott in two seasons at South Florida. Speaking of Coach Scott, our Jason Shepard spoke with the coach in the build up to BYU and South Florida. And you heard from Coach Scott a little earlier. You're going to hear from him uh, once again. Again, this is uh, Coach Jeff Scott, head coach of USF. And he begins by uh, answering Jason's question about uh, how his guys have handled the offseason and training camp leading up to BYU in week one. Yeah, it's been a a very unique offseason for us. I mean, we had a a lot of additions that uh, transfers and and, uh, high school, about 40 new guys joined our team uh, from January to, to June. So for us, uh, a lot of new guys coming in, uh, obviously two new coordinators and our defensive coordinator, Bob Shoup, and offensive coordinator, Travis Trickett. Uh, but, you know, so a lot of new guys coming in and really, uh, you know, everybody getting on the same page. Uh, it's been a really good offseason. Our guys have worked extremely hard. Uh, it's very hot here in Florida. It's been a very uh, hot summer, like most of them are around here. So, you know, hopefully that's uh, prepared us for the, the weather uh, here on Saturday and, and later on for the season. But, yeah, there's no doubt. Uh, I like to say that, you know, the, the the days are long, but the years are short, right? So they're a bunch of long days, but they add up pretty quickly. And, and here we are uh, getting ready to kick it off. You mentioned it, and it, you are in somewhat of a unique situation because you do have so much production from last year coming back, yet there are so many things about your squad that are new. Those typically don't go hand in hand, yet that's what you're dealing with right now. Yeah, I think it's really just kind of the, the new age of college athletics and new age of college football, you know, obviously uh, with the, the transfer portal, the one-time transfer. And then I think, you know, for me coming into the program here at South Florida two years ago and really establishing the culture and, and, and the standard of how we're going to do things and, and, and trying to find the players that, that fit our culture and also fit our um, offense, defense, and special teams. You know, so there's definitely, uh, you know, been some opportunity for some new guys to come in, I think, Probably one of the biggest uh, changes uh, for us from a year ago to now is I just feel like we have a lot more depth at some of the key positions than maybe where, where we were a year ago. 
And a lot of that is from some of the new guys uh, that have uh, joined us. One of the big acquisitions through the offseason, as you mentioned, um, was a new quarterback. And it's quarterback BYU has faced when he was at Baylor. My question to you about Gary Bohannon is why was he the guy to lead this offense? Now, I think for us, um, you know, we, we were looking for a quarterback that had quality experience. I mean, there's a lot of quarterbacks that are the, maybe the been the backup sitting on the bench in a Power 5 program. And they're looking to go somewhere and be a starter. And really, for our situation, I was looking for someone that's already kind of been there and been through the battles. And, you know, the success that he had last year at Baylor, um, you know, going 10 and 2 as the starter and, and, uh, you know, some big wins. And and really, I think for us, just his overall experience uh, on the field and then also uh, his knowledge of, uh, you know, just different offenses, the different things that defenses want to do, just a little bit more uh, age and and maturity at that position I felt like was needed uh, for this offense to really take the next step this year. How would you describe your defense right now heading into the season? Uh, I would describe them as improved uh, from from what I've seen in the offseason, from where we were a year ago. I think uh, Coach Bob Shoup, our new defensive coordinator, you know, he has an outstanding resume. um, And, you know, he's really done a great job very quickly here. And, uh, you know, building confidence in in our players, really putting them in. uh, We've moved some guys around to some different positions uh, within his scheme that I think has uh, really fit our uh, talent and skill set probably better than where we were a year ago. So uh, I've seen a lot of improvement from them in spring practice and in fall camp. And and now it'll be, uh, you know, it'd be time for them to go out and, and show that improvement on the field Saturday. As you certainly know, and it's usually the case, whoever wins the line of scrimmage typically ends the day feeling pretty good. Um, your offensive line is deep and experienced. You've added some depth on the D line. How would you describe both of your lines right now? Yeah, I think you, you've you got it pretty close there. Offensive line, you know, we've got uh, four, four guys coming back that have played a lot of ball together. I mean, these guys, uh, all four – I actually were seniors a year ago. They all had a chance to leave, and and uh, a couple of them had a chance maybe to, to look at playing at the next level, and, and all four chose to come back for their super senior year. Uh, they're a very close group. Uh, they communicate uh, very well. They, they work uh, together very well. So I really uh, feel confident in that group up front. Defensive line has probably been uh, the area where I feel like we've improved the most in the offseason from where we were a year ago, not really having the – the um, overall length, athleticism, uh, size, and depth that we needed to, to be able to compete week in and week out. And uh, in the offseason, our uh, returning guys have really worked hard. Uh, defensive end Tramel Logan uh, is a guy that was 211 pounds when he got here two years ago, and now he's about 252 pounds. So really worked hard and, and, and putting on good weight. And I think his maturity level at that position has really shown up here in the offseason. And then you look at a guy like Jatorian Hansford, defensive end we got from Missouri uh, that's transferred in. Uh, he was a, a great addition, bringing some size and athleticism to that defensive end spot. And then, um, you know, Rashawn Yates is a returning player that's uh, moved. He's played both inside and outside for us uh, in the past. He can do a little bit of both. And then we also have another D tackle, Rashad Chaney, a transfer from Minnesota. Uh, and then there's a, there's about six guys behind them, and uh, four of them are transfers coming in. So I think overall the biggest thing at defensive line is uh, we brought in a lot of uh, new bodies to really uh, be able to give us the depth and, and size that we need to have a chance uh, to compete against a really good team like BYU. As we start to wrap it up, let's focus in specifically on the matchup. Obviously, you guys were in Provo last year, so you got to see this team. You did not see Jaron Hall, so maybe just your your overall impressions of this BYU team and what you expect on Saturday. Yeah, I think, number one, it's a uh, very experienced team that's playing with a lot of confidence. I mean, you look last year, they, they won 10 games, and as you know, the majority of those guys are coming back. And uh, I said this earlier in the week, it, it reminds me of, of my years coaching at Clemson. You know, when, when you're having a lot of success and a team plays well together, they're confident. You know your scheme inside and out. You, you play to your strengths and you play together. And so whenever I, I've watched, uh, you know, all of the games of BYU last year, you know, I see a confident group that plays well together. I think Jaron uh, Hall, their quarterback, is very talented. Uh, he looks like he makes really good decisions with the football. And then uh, if things do break down, I mean, he's shown to be able to, to extend the play and have a explosive capability as a runner as well. Um, but overall, I just feel like um, we're playing a, a very confident uh, team, a, a team that is uh, really good leadership, a lot of veterans, 
uh, coming back. And, you know, they're, they're not going to give up anything easy. Uh, they're going to – everything that you get against an experienced team like this, you're going to have to to earn each and every down. And uh, obviously, you know, last year that was a long time ago uh, whenever we played <laughs> – played that game and, and, and they're, they're different. I feel like they're much improved uh, from where they were early last year. And, and, and uh, I feel like we are as well. Coach, thank you so much for your time. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. I uh, really do appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Uh, Jeff Scott, USF head coach, a one and 18 against FBS teams in his two years here in Tampa. This USF programs two and 23 in its last 25 FBS games, four and 32 in its last 36 games against FBS opponents. Last year's USF team went uh, 2-10, and 1-7 and seven in league the 2020 COVID year. They were 1-8, and 0-7 oh in American Athletic Conference play. And again, Jeff Scott takes it into his third year. This is the 26th season of football for South Florida. They are 19-6 all-time in season openers under Kalani Sitake. And this is his seventh season. He's 5-1. In his season openers, only a season opening loss to Utah, denting his record. Speaking of that Utah game, except for a field goal by Utah in their 2019 game, no opponent has scored against BYU in the first quarter of a season opener in the Kalani Sitake era. So Kalani's teams come out ready to roll defensively. No one scores against BYU in the first quarter of openers, but for the one time Utah scored a field goal, in 2019. That stat coming in courtesy of our statistician Ralph Sokolowski working this game remotely back home. Thank you, Ralph, for the tidbit. Speaking of Ralph, Ralph also informs me that Jaron Hall, BYU quarterback, needs just 170 yards of total offense to pass Jay Keeps and enter the top 20 in BYU career total offense. So that number is in play today. Greg Rubel and Riley Nelson here in our broadcast booth. Mitchell Jurgens is somewhere here at Raymond James Stadium. Let's see if we can find Mitch and find out where he is and how things are going down at field level during this lengthy weather delay at Raymond James Stadium where the rain continues to fall but lighten up and the skies continue to lighten up but there's been enough darkness and lightning in the vicinity that we've been in this holding pattern for nearly two hours. Mitch, what's up? Well, don't know where Mitch is right now. Well, oh, is he there? Yeah, I'm here. Here I'm we back, go, Mitch. Uh, Mitch actually, <laughs> yeah, I'm back on the field, um, just waiting for the players to get released here. It seems like it's going to be pretty quick. I mean, you'd think um, if it was a little bit more, you know, worrisome for fans to be in the seats, they're not clearing out the fans. So the hope is that it's it's here shortly that they're going to re- release the players. What they didn't do was take the. Uh, take the fans out of the stands, right? They, they've, they've allowed the fans to stay in the seating area as opposed to earlier when during the official delay they were brought out of the seating bowl altogether. So they just had another lightning strike uh, 20 seconds ago officially it looks like. And and so it's another reset uh, during this uh, during this delay. And, and then once the teams take the field, it could be as many as 20 minutes of warm-up time. And so we could be looking at something closer to 4.30 Mountain Time, 6.30 in the Eastern Time Zone before this game gets played. Uh, that's where things are right now. Uh, it's just it's just strike after strike after strike, and, and they just keep on coming. And so that's where we are at Raymond James Stadium here in Tampa. It is always the risk at this time of year and this time of the country that weather becomes a prevailing factor, and that it has been here today and that is very unfortunate for these two teams so amped and ready to go and not able to get this game underway and so we are at least based on the USF football Twitter account they said we had another lightning strike and our time to take the field has reset this from USF says as soon as we can take the field teams will have a 20 minute warm up period and then we can play football so that's where we stand we stand waiting to play the season opener between BYU and South Florida we are in another 30-minute lightning clock delay. As of when, Greg? When was that tweet sent? One minute ago. Oh, wow. I keep seeing flashes. Obviously, they've got all the jumbotrons and all the advertisement screens going along that are flashing and all that. And it was is so perplexing to me as to what you've already alluded to earlier, Greg. We're looking in front of us. And, yeah, I mean, we've got some kind of clouds and stuff, but it's majority blue skies, at least the half of the stadium that we can see. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an abundance of caution to be certain as the fans are all still in the stands. And, and yet uh, the rules are the rules. If it's within six miles and 30 seconds flashbang, they're going to say it's a lightning delay. 
and hold things for 30 minutes, even though, um, you know, what we're seeing on the radar screen is that things are pushing past Raymond James Stadium here in Tampa. But we stay in a delay ahead of BYU and USF. It is 3.43 Mountain Time, 5.43 in the Eastern Time Zone, nearly two hours after today's scheduled kick time. Expanding out the radar map to Central Florida, it could be that things keep coming this way as the night goes along. It's just that kind of look right now on the radar map. But if there's a window, we hope the Cougars and the Bulls can explore it to get this game in. I've never really considered the thought at any point of this game not getting played. Um, even if it delays for hours, I just never thought we wouldn't play football. But, uh, you know, the longer this thing goes, the, the less certainty you have that things stay on track. And again, if I look at my weather map right now, my radar map, I can see in central Florida uh, the reds and the yellows beginning to percolate. Now, if they can go more northerly as opposed to northwesterly, we could be fine. As it stands, we sit and wait for the next strike, and they just keep on coming, which means 30 more minutes of waiting. I mean, you can't predict, or you never know what's going to happen with thunderstorms. Uh, but in talking to some of the locals, like the staff that's working the press box up here and stuff, it seems that the lightning mostly takes place in the afternoon. And if rain is going to persist, it will be just that rain into the evening. So you're hoping that the local knowledge of the weather uh, holds true there. And then secondly, I, I mean, it's going to have to be something severe for this game to not be played when you think about the expense that BYU is taking and moving their entire team out here coming out an extra day early I mean you got to get the return on the investment you have to actually play the game so I imagine we will wait this thing out until the very bitter end uh, which you know barring some crazy event of weather I I think we will continue uh, with the game it's just how long will we have to wait to kick it off we were fortunate enough to visit with BYU defensive coordinator Elisa Tuiaki for a good 10 minutes a short time ago because the coaching booth has stayed populated here. The coaches haven't gone down to the locker room. The ones who stay up in the booth and the box are still in the box. And if, if things go well, we might even get a minute or two with Aaron Roderick, the offensive coordinator. But A-Rod was, has li- literally been kind of reconfiguring his offensive play sheet as this delay has gone on. And then when the rain came down, I'm sure he began thinking about more plays that might lean to maybe a little more ground attack when it was torrential there for a while. So literally Aaron Roderick has been kind of retooling what he wants to do in this game based on the delay. And we're going to prevail and see if we can't get uh, maybe A-Rod to duck out of his booth and into ours for a minute or two. Again, it's asking a lot for a coach or a coordinator to break from their routine to pop in, but then it can be ball broken from the routine. We are nearly two hours delayed kickoff between BYU and South Florida. We'll take another two-minute break before we continue our coverage from Raymond James Stadium. It is BYU and USF and a long-awaited and even longer-awaited season opener on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Let's head back to the Built Bar broadcast booth and join the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. Holding pattern here in Tampa, BYU and USF. Ready to play football. Not quite ready to play football. Have been ready to play football for a couple of hours, but weather delays here at Raymond James Stadium. Let's take a break. Let's uh, pause for a station identification. Let's pause 10 seconds for a station ID on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. BYU and USF in our latest 30-minute lightning clock delay. Every time there's a measurable lightning strike within six miles of the stadium, the 30-minute clock resets, and we've had multiple resets. Once we do get teams back on the field we're told it'll be 20 minutes of warm-up before kickoff and so we are just uh waiting for the atmospherics to improve to the extent that we can get this thing underway but uh it's impossible to forecast because while encouraging things have happened riley that is fans came in back into the stands the band came out of the tunnel we were told they were three minutes away from getting teams on the field and then seconds away from the three minute clock expiring a lightning strike and we're back to square one and, again, again, the rules being the rules, once it hits, you're, it's another half hour. Yeah, and during that t- entire time, we've been able to see blue skies at least at some portion of the stadium. So it's not like we're socked in in a major storm pattern. So, anyway, just it's a little bit disheartening. I, I, I do wonder if the stadium crew has put on the music and they've allowed the fans back in the stadium so that people didn't start going home, right? It's, it's very disheartening. Whenever you have to wait over two hours for a game to start. Uh, but the fans thus far are sticking true. Obviously, the BYU faithful. I think the longer this thing goes, the Southern Florida fans are going to 
go back going to be more likely to go back to their homes and give up on watching this game in person. But I think the BYU faithful. Well, they're going to stick around. Oh, they're going to say whether they've traveled for the game or whether they're locals who get the rare chance to see their team play here in the Tampa area. Uh, so that's going to give a little bit of an advantage to BYU. Uh, but, man, it's we've had to wait already so many months to kick this off. Uh, these extra, these last couple hours have been excruciating. Let's head back to our scoreboard studio. Jason Shepard's been standing by as we've been talking here in Tampa. A lot, a lot of college football is getting played. Games have gone final. Jason has a look at top 25 finals and more. Let's head back to Jason Shepard for a scoreboard update during our extended pregame coverage ahead of BYU and USF in a weather delay here in Tampa. Thank you very much, Greg. And look, let's look at this as a sign of optimism because earlier today, uh, you had an extremely long delay between Texas A&M and Sam Houston. They have resumed play, so let's hope that that bodes well for our situation in Tampa, Florida. But the score, they are in the fourth quarter, 7.44 to go, and it is number six Texas A&M shutting out Sam Houston by a score of 31 to nothing. Here's a score that's probably not going to surprise too many people, certainly not if you've watched any of this game. Number three, Georgia, and number 11, Oregon, third quarter action, 542 to go, and it's the Bulldogs up big, 35-3. to three. Don't forget, BYU at Eugene in a couple of weeks. Third quarter action between number nine, Oklahoma, and UTEP. The Sooners with a 25-point advantage. The score in the third is 35-10. to 10. Number 16, Miami with a 32-point lead over Bethune-Cookman in the third quarter. 42-10, the score in favor of Miami. Number 19, Arkansas, and number 23, Cincinnati. The Razorbacks led this game initially by two touchdowns. It was 14 to nothing. The Bearcats have come back, cut that lead in half. It is now Arkansas 14-7. to Number 24, Houston at UTSA, and this is a bit of a surprise to say the least. They're in the third quarter, and UTSA has a 20-point lead over the Houston Cougars. Well, it looks like they've actually taken a touchdown off the board. So uh, right now it's actually my screen updated, and it took a touchdown off. So we'll have to wait. Either way, UTSA has a 21-7 to lead according to this, and it may be larger. Uh, but the story there is that Houston is trailing at UTSA. Number 21, Ole Miss leading Troy 21-3 to that game in the third quarter. Coming up later on tonight, other top 25 action, 14th-ranked USC hosting Rice, number 7 Utah at Florida, Albany at number 10 Baylor. The Bears will be in Provo next Saturday evening. Number 19, Wisconsin. Hosting Illinois State tonight, coming up at 5 o'clock Mountain Time. Also at 5 o'clock Mountain Time, 20th ranked Kentucky will face Miami of Ohio. Number one, Alabama, hosting Utah State. That game getting underway at 5.30 Mountain Time. And then a big matchup between two teams in the top five. Number five, Notre Dame, who BYU will face in Las Vegas this season, taking on number two, Ohio State. Uh, that game on uh, on ABC for those uh, interested in watching that one, that one's probably going to get the uh, the biggest attention of all the games today. Some finals in the top 25. Number 8, Michigan over Colorado State, 51-7. to And number 13, NC State survives, and I mean survives, East Carolina, 21-20. East Carolina missed the extra point that would have tied it, and then they missed a game-winning field goal that would have won it. So those are your top 25 scores. Do want to remind you one more time that coming up later on tonight, two other B. BYU teams in action on campus tonight. Uh, the first one to get underway at 7 o'clock Mountain Time is BYU Women's Volleyball. They will be hosting Pitt at the Smith Fieldhouse. That's a game that you can see uh, on BYU TV and the BYU TV app. And then at 8 p.m. Mountain Time, a game you will hear right here on the new skin BYU Sports Network, it is number 6 BYU Women's Soccer hosting CSUN, so Cal State Northridge at Southfield to take on the BYU Cougars. You can join myself and Rachel Manning Jorgensen on the radio call on the BYU Radio app uh, coming up at 8 o'clock Mountain Time. Originally, we thought this was going to work out perfect. The game's going to be done. I can go right from post game from football and go over and call the soccer game. Well, Mother Nature had other plans, so we're all just sort of rolling with the punches, so to speak. Uh, in the meantime, let's get you back to Tampa, Florida, and rejoin Riley Nelson and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. 
Rolling with the punches and rolling in the deep as it was heavy, heavy rainfall a short time ago. It's lightened up. In fact, I don't know that it is actually raining right now, Riley. Can you see raindrops out there? Is I don't believe it is. And judging by the what, looking at the fans down there, the lack of ponchos and umbrellas, yeah. I think the the rainfall has stopped. And, and I, 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 th I think our lightning clock runs unabated right now. I, I don't think we've had additional strikes since it last went into our 30-minute delay. So we could be on the back end of the latest 30-minute holdup. And if that's the case, we could be playing football here in the next uh, half hour, 35 minutes. But we remain in a delay of nearly two hours. This game was scheduled to kick off at 2.02 .02 Mountain Time. It is 3.55 Mountain Time for Raymond James Stadium in Tampa, Florida. BYU and South Florida, USF in their season openers. Raymond James Stadium has hosted three Super Bowls, including the one in 2021, nine months ago, that uh, saw uh, Tom Brady and the Bucks win on their home field. Tampa Bay beat the Chiefs in Super Bowl 55 back in 2021. That was Super Bowl number three in this stadium. It also hosted the 2017 CFP Championship game. Raymond James Stadium, capacity 65,890, and USF has an all-time win rate of 64%, 95 and 54 in games played at Raymond James Stadium. Well, about 90 minutes ago, uh, no, scratch that. It was uh, about uh, two and a half hours ago. You heard from Kalani Sitake in our pregame conversation. We'll take a break. When we come back, you'll hear again what Kalani had to say about leading into today's season opener at South Florida when it gets played. We'll come back and hear from the head coach, the Cougs, on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Score points on offense, limit points on defense, and, and, and uh, create havoc, and then uh, be efficient like we always have been on special teams, whether it's cover game, the cover, cover teams or, or uh, you know, our, our, um, our return team. So uh, we're looking forward to seeing all three phases work and complement each other. I'm really proud of our coaches, proud of our, proud of our players, and, and uh, just looking forward to this game. Just some personnel notes right now. It was a pretty healthy camp, all things considered, but you're down a wide out going into today? Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're um, down Gunnar Romney, but uh, we're hoping very to the, to the end that he would be able to go. But, um, you know, we're looking forward to seeing him soon. Um, after that, you know, we're just, I think for the most part our team's healthy. Guys are a little bit banged up, but that's okay. The, the uh, you know, the... the the adrenaline will overcome some of the the soreness, and um, our guys worked hard. I, I feel I feel like our guys, our guys are fresh. Uh, there's a, a small amount of guys that are having to overcome a few um, soreness issues, but uh, that that's uh, I'm I'm really proud of the way our guys are, are prepared and. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens, but I'm looking forward to seeing them out there. I know you love your O-line rotation. Yeah, and, and you'll see a bunch of guys. I mean, we feel comfortable with all the guys that made the trip, so um, we'll see if, if Coach Funk wants to use them all, and I've given them the freedom to do whatever they think is right, keep our guys healthy and keep them fresh, but also we've had a lot of guys do different different change a uh, change of lineups, and um, usually that's, that's unconventional. Teams don't like doing that, but uh, when you have this type of depth, I think you have to be able to accommodate that and get the talent on the field. Defensively, uh, it's pretty much a full go in terms of who you expected to be out there for game one, right? Yeah, and, and um, yeah, we got a lot of numbers, a lot of guys, and, uh, you know, we're, we're looking forward to, for me, um, scheme and all that stuff is great, but looking for, towards the fundamentals of the game, like tackling well, um, using the right technique, uh, that's going to be the key on defense, and the big plays will come our way. We just need to make sure that we, when, we, when we have an opportunity, we capitalize on it and, and get, get, create some havoc. I know uh, Bohanna is a really good player. Uh, but when he's comfortable, it, it, it makes things really difficult for us. And we weren't able to disrupt him last year. Hopefully we can change that up at the second time. All of your coaches are back in the same place as they were last year. USF, new offensive coordinator, new defensive coordinator, new starting quarterback, a lot of novelty there. If you're the head coach of that team, how comfortable are you with all that novelty in a game one situation? Well, I know I know Coach Scott's a good coach and, and, and been around championship teams. So, uh, you know, he, he has that Clemson um, background. So he ha he'll have capable coaches. Uh, I'm, I'm the thing I'm um, uh, more than anything just looking forward to seeing them out there because there's no film. Uh, we can kind of um, predict and, and maybe hope to see what we're going to see. But there's be, there'll be some things that we weren't expecting, and, and that's okay. But, um, yeah, the, the, even the depth, the depth chart, things like that, we were just there's a lot of unknowns yeah. going into this game. But that's all right. We, we uh we we know about our guys and what our team can do and that's all that matters. So generally, what would you expect from them on offense and defense, really quickly? 
Well, I think they're going to stick with their background. I know that they have um, their, their coaches, and they're, they're going to be a little bit more spread, but I wouldn't be surprised to see them try to just just pound the ball and, and, and be an RPO team on offense and on defense. I think they're going to play a lot of pressure. And so we're planning on all that. We've, we've uh, just made some stuff up, and what, what we're going to see, we might not see some of the things, but that's okay. I'd rather over-prepare than be under-prepared. And, 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 and when you sit there and you go, well, I hope they don't do that. That's not a good strategy. So we didn't, we didn't use hope as a strategy. Yeah. We're going to, yeah, we, we, we might have over-prepared, but that's okay. Okay, finally, you're back in the heat and humidity of South Florida. Yeah, but I, I look at the way we traveled, the way that our budget has been, the, the attempt to make this an easier trip on the boys, where we stay, how we travel with Delta, and um, that, that stuff matters a lot. And uh, we, we ch- changed up our practice and our preparation for this for this game specifically. We we use science and we use the research there that's available from the sports scientists and, and from our training room. So we're coming into this game a lot different than we were back when last time we were here. I feel a lot of confidence. And and, and and what we've done and how we prepared, and uh, we'll just find out, man. I, mean, I just, it's this is the longest you know moment right now. Like <laughs> let's get to the game already. And but uh, I, I am, I'm just sitting here, just excited and just trying to, just trying to calm down before we get to it. <laughs> excited to get it going with you, Kalani. Thank you for the time. Best of luck. We'll talk to you post game. Appreciate it, Greg. Go Cougs. All right, that was Kalani two and a half hours ago saying he was ready for the game already, and nothing has happened since that time as uh, we are in this lengthy weather delay that has now reached to two hours and three minutes. Now, the positive news is it's been 23 minutes since the last registered lightning strike, which would mean we're 23 minutes into a 30-minute lightning clock, which if we can stay lightning-free for seven minutes, the teams get clear to be on the field, and then you're still 20 minutes away from playing, and that puts you closer to 430 Mountain, 6.30 Eastern time. So you're looking at a two and a half hour delay. There have been football games that have been played in roughly two and a half hours. It's, uh, that's, on, that's on the light end. But still, this is a, this is a massive delay and a, and a serious interruption of everyone's routines, coaches, players, and otherwise. And uh, it's just remarkable that we've gone this long and stayed with you without really able to say, okay, we'll break for an hour or they've set a kickoff time in. You know, nothing's ever been set. No times have ever been set. But we just kind of roll with it and glad you stick with us here and appreciate you uh, being flexible with us as we continue to lead up to a now two and a half, a, new, a now two hour delayed kickoff for BYU and USF. A couple of statistical notes and follow up from Riley Nelson on a couple of things. I mentioned earlier in the broadcast how last year's BYU offense was statistically so impressive in so many different offensive categories. I brought these up to Aaron Roderick during the coordinator's corner on Monday, and he said you you forgot to include sacks allowed. We allowed very few sacks last year at BYU, and he's right. BYU was a top-10 team in fewest sacks allowed. And then there's this this number. BYU under Kalani Sitake is 16-1 and with zero sacks allowed. Just keep your quarterback clean, and you're almost sure to win the game. That also means be decisive, that your quarterback is decisive with where he's going with the ball. Sacks, are it's, it's two-sided. One is, are your guys picking up the rush and doing their assignments and executing on their assignments? But the second is the quarterback getting the ball out of his hands. So uh, we've talked about this already in the pregame, but Jaron is not only very decisive, but the decisions that he makes are normally good ones that tend to uh, have not only a positive result, but they very rarely tend to have a negative result, meaning in the terms, uh, meaning that they result in a turnover. What do you see or what do you expect Jaron to look like if he looks any different from last season to this in terms of, uh, let's say, decision making? Yeah, you know, I wonder how much more, I I don't think last year, here's one of the things that I've been excited or anxious to see Zach Wilson uh, who I I mean I think by all accounts I think if we even asked Zach he they practiced together for two years and were together Jaron and Zach were like I, th- I would guess like Jaron's a little bit better runner from what I hear of of you know timed 40s and races and some things like that like Jaron's probably a little bit more skilled yet Zach seemed to have more big runs he definitely had more touchdowns and I think the reason why we didn't see that from Jaron last year is because in short yarded situation, well, bottom line, short is you had Tyler Algier, right? So I think his decision making in the pass game, I don't expect much to change there. What I expect is in the RPO had to see how his decision making goes within the game flow of pulling the ball down 
and uh, and running in the RPO game. And then balancing that with, of course, everyone's stated desire that he stays healthy and plays the entire 13-game schedule. The other stat note that I wanted to uh, to address was was red zone. And we talked about it in pregame. In fact, I used it as our high place comfort zone uh, stat. BYU under Jeff Grimes in 2020 was seventh in red zone TD percentage. New coordinator, Aaron Roderick, and he was already heavily involved, right? But they, they changed coordinators, and BYU goes from seventh to third in red zone touchdown percentage last season, 2020, 2020 and 2021. So back-to-back top ten seasons as a top ten team in producing TDs inside the 20. And, and the package of BYU's plays, whether it's, it's run or pass play, when they get inside the 20, Aaron dials up some really good stuff. I think you need two things to be successful. Three in the run game. Well, you need a lot of things. But here are the three that I'm going to talk about for you, Greg. Um, one is you need to be able to establish the run. If you can't move the ball when the defense is tight and closer to the line of scrimmage, if you can't move the ball on the ground, it's going to be very tough sledding for you. So you need to be able to run the ball when the defense does not have to cover as much turf on the field. Second, you need tall receivers that can win 50-50 balls. In the past, that's been the likes of Neil Pau'u. And for this year's team and, and others, for a lot of those guys are coming back, though, that you've had in the past. Puka Nakua is a good 50-50 ball guy. Isaac Rex, right, the play that unfortunately got hurt on his ankle, that was an amazing play that he was just barely, he had like one spike of his cleat out of bounds in the back of the end zone against USC. But he's one of those guys. I know that they have the intention to use Dallin Holker as one of those guys. And then Keanu Hill is one that... He, he started to come on strong towards the end of the lesson, but he definitely has the body and he's got the skill set to be able to do that. So, uh, But if they can get Chris Brooks going with the offensive line to run it, I just mentioned four, maybe even five players that Jaron has the opportunity. And then you add in the element of two years ago when I mentioned, you know, I mentioned Zach Wilson scor- scoring so many touchdowns. I think he had eight or nine uh, uh most of them were on reads down inside the five qb reads down inside the five where the defense was selling out on stopping the running back that he was able to pull it and walk in the end zone so when you have that three-headed attack it's no wonder that byu is a top season or is a top three red zone team and that uh th- that gives you every reason to expect that this year they should uh stay in those ranks all right, that's Riley Nelson. My name is Greg Rubel, Mitchell Jurgens, the third member of our broadcast crew. And for the last half hour plus, probably 45 minutes, fans have been back in the stands, whereas earlier during the weather delay, they were told to take cover and under sheltered areas and concourses. Well, they've been in the stands for a good 45 minutes, but we were in a 30-minute lightning clock that has now expired. So if there have been no more lightning strikes in the last 30 minutes, we should be getting the players back on the field shortly. And I say that because the sideline crew, the chain gang and those with the American Athletic Conference vests have now taken the field. And so, and, and uh, South Florida football staffers are now on their sideline area. So we are seeing the kinds of things that lead you to indicate that we're getting close to playing football. We are more than uh, two hours since our scheduled kick time. This game was set to go at 4.02 Eastern time at 6.11 Eastern time. Two hours and nine minutes of weather delay to this point. And it's all thunderstorm and lightning related. There was a period of a half hour of very heavy rainfall, but rain's no longer an issue. And we can't see or hear anything in the way of thunder or lightning in the last half hour. And the lightning clock that we had most recently set has been allowed to expire, I believe, which means we're closer to players taking the field. That is our standing as of this moment, but nothing official to us. In fact, the contact we've been getting has been you know, pretty informal. Our engineer, Michael Wimmer, has been uh, letting us know what's happening. But in terms of official people jumping in and saying, here's a time, here's a limit, really hasn't happened. We are very much uh, just uh, ad-libbing everything in the way of buildup to BYU and USF. But I get the sense. looks like footballs are now going out on the field. We should be close to getting players back on the green grass. Let's take a two-minute break and see if my optimism holds. We're breaking for two minutes. BYU and USF are coming up on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Let's head back to the Built Bar broadcast booth and join the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. The USF Bulls have taken the field here at Raymond James Stadium, which means the last or the next big noise you'll hear from the crowd will be the BYU Cougars leaving their portal and tunnel and coming out of the football field. So we are closer to football 
The last lightning delay clock was allowed to expire. No strikes within 30 minutes. And we were told that when players hit the field, we'd be 20 minutes away from football here at Raymond James Stadium. BYU and USF about set to go. Again, the USF Bulls are on the field. You can hear their fans. And now we anticipate the arrival of BYU and to hear from Cougar Nation in their royal blue here in Tampa. And that could be just moments away. Riley, the Bulls players are fired up. They ran over to their student section immediately. Thank them for sticking around, and they're fired up and ready to go. Yeah, they definitely are. I thought that was interesting. They were called up by Coach Scott, and, uh, you know, it looked like they were just going to break them to position groups, and then he sent them to the other end of the stadium where the fans are packed. BYU is getting ready to come out of the field. Yeah, but they can't because they're, they're waiting South for the Florida. last. They're waiting for the yeah. last USF player to clear. But here come the Cougars, and we're going to hear it from Cougar Nation here in a second. As BYU, after a two and a quarter hour delay, is maybe 15 or 20 minutes away from kicking off the 2022 season, the Cougs are poised and ready to enter the playing surface. And here come the Cougs here in Tampa. BYU in the all-whites with navy trim, USF, green jerseys, gold pants and helmets, and white letters and numerals. BYU in the all-whites tonight, including white helmets and the navy blue oval Y stretch Y. Well, it had been two-plus hours since we'd seen players on, uh, on the field in just warm-up. And now they're back in full uniform and ready to go. BYU and USF will play football momentarily. That's our belief, and the hope is that they can play an entire game without additional delays. Again, we are four and a quarter hours exactly. Rather, we are two and a quarter hours, exactly two hours and 15 minutes past our scheduled start time for BYU and USF. BYU opening in AAC territory. The Cougs will be home to play Baylor in the Cougs home opener next Saturday, and that'll be an 8.15 Mountain Time start at LaBelle Edwards Stadium. Then it's on to Oregon, and Oregon is getting tuned up by Georgia today down in Atlanta. It's 49-3. to Georgia pulled their starters with five minutes to go in the third quarter. Yeah, ugly. That's what's two weeks from now for BYU. Baylor next week. It'll be Baylor in BYU's home opener. It'll be the first uh, home opener for BYU against Baylor since 1984, the national championship season. We're now being told that our official kick time will be 6.36 Eastern, 4.36 in the Mountain Time Zone. So we have a start time, and it's 18 minutes away. That's good news. Let's take a two-minute break. We'll come back and continue our coverage of BYU football on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. You're listening to BYU football on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Frank Rubel, Riley Nelson, and Mitchell Juergens, your broadcast trio here at Raymond James Stadium in Tampa, Florida. This game was to have begun at 2.02 Mountain Time. It's now 4.20 Mountain Time. And the new kick time will be 4.36. So it'll be, if it goes off on time, the new on time, a two-hour and 34-minute weather delay. Let's bring in Mitchell Juergens, the third member of our broadcast team, to find out where Mitch is and what he sees from field level. Mitch. Yeah, so it's it's fun to see the back on the field. Um, BYU players are just starting to warm up uh, about 16 minutes pre-kick. One thing I've been actually shocked by, I mean, the, the downpour was very heavy. But this field is incredibly dry and hard still. I don't know if it's the, you know, the NFL, you know, caliber grass, but man, they it, it dried out pretty good. So I don't I don't see the weather as long as the rain holds off being too much of a factor, um, as the grass the field is is held up and in pretty good condition. So excellent drainage and uh, no ill effects from a, a turf standpoint. Bermuda grass, natural grass surface. One question I had yesterday. Uh, when the rain was coming down was, yeah, would they would they tarp the field during this time of year? And the answer apparently is is they just kind of let it ride. Um, and, and the drainage has been excellent here 
at Raymond James Stadium. A couple years ago, three years ago, Riley, when we were here uh, in Tampa, did we go to did we go to the Columbia restaurant? We did. Yeah. So we visited that place last night. I bring that up because on the way to the restaurant, it was just tropical, torrential, hurricane force type winds and rains, or uh, not wind, but rain last night. Uh, BYU fan Chris McRae, who took us a couple years ago to Burns Steakhouse. We had a nice night with uh, Chris. Well, I went to dinner last night with Chris and his family and, and some others to uh, to the Columbia, which is uh, it's Spanish eating, right? It's good. Well, it's Cuban, but it's Spanish style. And, and uh, had another great meal. Missed you. You were not yet in town. But uh, Chris wanted me to let you know that uh, you really missed out. It's a great night. Strong, mec- strong recommend on both those places for anybody visiting Tampa. Yeah, Burn Steakhouse was unbelievable three years ago, and uh, the Columbia is a remarkable building and restaurant in uh, Ybor City, part of Tampa here. And that was a fun night with Chris McRae and his family. Thanks to Chris and the McRae's for their hospitality and uh, a great food and good conversation last night. And uh, you weren't there, Riley, because, well, tell the fans where you've been the last little bit. I was eating real Spanish food in Madrid <laughs> you know, through, my, uh, through my work. Uh, I was able to uh, earn a rewards trip that uh, took us over to to Europe and spent some time in Spain, which I was uh, excited for because uh, it's where I served my mission. I served in Barcelona, Spain from 07 to 09. And uh, I give a little shout. You get, we're giving a shout-out to Chris. I want to give a little shout-out to my wife, Mandy, my two sons, Lou and George, and my daughter, Margot, for humoring me and letting me drag them halfway across the world uh, for the last 10 days to spend some time uh, in Spain uh, for the work, and then also some time in Norway visiting some family. My my uh, patriarchal line, uh, like meaning my, my great-great-grandfather who immigrated over from Norway, was only one of ten siblings to come over here, and we've maintained contact with our Norwegian family. And so as long as we were going over to Europe, it's only an hour-and-a-half flight from Oslo to Madrid, so we spent some time with them. But again, thanks to my family for making the trip halfway around the world. And then we came back. There's some, uh, there's some mothers out there, I'm sure, listening uh, that have been through something similar. From Madrid to Atlanta, we flew, but I had to send her on the Atlanta to, to Salt Lake City leg alone with three kids uh, who, who had just uh, been international, mm-hmm. had been traveling internationally for 10 years. So, But they made it home safe and sound, and uh, my wife, at least as reported through text messages, still has her sanity. So God bless her. So. Well, I'm glad you got here in time to get, uh, of course, yeah, as it turned out, uh, delays were the order of the day. Yep. I mentioned earlier how our engineers, uh, two of them, uh, engineer and assistant intern, got uh, waylaid in Dallas, ended up driving from Dallas to Tampa. And that was kind of the theme for the weekend once uh, the delays began to pile up, including a two-and-a-half-hour weather delay here in Tampa. Uh, some streaks of note. Tampa, or rather USF, playing here in Tampa, had lost 11 consecutive, has lost 11 consecutive games against ranked teams. BYU comes in ranked. USF last beat a ranked team six years ago. Number 22, Navy. They beat them 52-45. to 45. USF had lost 17 consecutive FBS games before beating Temple at home last season. That's still the only FBS win of the Jeff Scott era. And now I'm going to ask you, off of something that I tweeted earlier today, which of these streaks for BYU interests you most or do you find most notable? These are a few win streaks BYU has going all of 10 wins or more. You ready? BYU's won 10 straight when leading at halftime. BYU's won 11 straight when leading or tied after three quarters. BYU's won 13 in a row when they score in every quarter. BYU's won 15 in a row when they score 30 or more. BYU's won 15 in a row when they're 50% or better on third downs. BYU's won 16 games in a row when they allow 21 or fewer. BYU's won 16 straight when they have a positive turnover margin. BYU's won 19 in a row when they don't turn the ball over at all. And BYU's won 23 straight when they score a touchdown on their opening drive. So which one speaks to you? The opening drive is, so, two. I think the most interesting for me is the last one, the opening drive, right? Opening drive touchdown. Yeah, I mean. Do that and win. Which seems so crazy to me because you, you've got, I mean, at least you have, depending on when it comes in the first quarter, but at least you have 45 minutes of gameplay left. Often it's probably more than 50 of the 60 minutes you have left to play. And you've done it. So what happens when the opponent scores a touchdown on its first possession? Is that good for the opponent? They have a losing record. 
<laughs> so BYU's won 23 straight games and has won 93% of games when they score a touchdown on the opening drive. When the opponent scores a touchdown on the opening drive, BYU stills, still wins 56% of those games. So whether it's start fast or finish strong, BYU's got you covered. The most relevant for me is the uh, turnover margin, 16 wins with turnover margin. That's not everything, but to me, the reason why uh, I point that one out is it seems to be the most relevant or the one w within the most control. Uh, Coach Roderick, we know uh, when we've met with him in the offseason and, and as you've interviewed him in coordinator's corner, he preaches that as one of the core tenets of this offense is protect the football and then at the defense go ahead and, and on that note uh, you bring up a great point you look at the two games that went sideways last year Baylor and Boise and it was it was that that was the difference maker it was the turnover margin and uh, and then on the defensive side of the ball creating those turnovers has been something that uh, has been emphasized throughout sometimes it's through a way of kind of creating havoc and pressure and other times it's just biding your time through uh, patient execution and capitalizing on uh, the other team's impatience but uh, that's the one that I think is probably the most relevant for this game today. Craig Rubel and Riley Nelson in the Built Bar broadcast booth Mitchell Jurgens down at field level let's recheck in with Mitch Mitchell with us as BYU and USF go through the uh, closing moments of their 20 minute pregame warm up and, and Mitch, it, it, it feels like every fan who was here to begin the delay and start this game at four o'clock has remained in the stands. And uh, I don't think we, I don't think we lost too many. Yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't have expected it either. Being the first game of the season, everybody came here to watch a football game. So yeah. whether you had to, you know, it started on time or waited two and a half hours or four hours, it didn't matter. These guys were coming to watch some football, kick off the college football season. And they looked amped and ready in the rain delays. They were singing to all the songs, having a good time. And, and that's what you'd expect in this environment. So um, it, it's fun to see everybody out here. And, and we're back in this college football scene. Everybody's happy. Everybody loves it. And we're, we're minutes away from kick. Mitch, stay with us here. So uh, during the uh, broadcast of BYU football with Kalani Sitake on Tuesday night, even though the uniform was revealed on Monday via social media, we now do, on the coaches' show, an in-person live mannequin reveal, if you will, of what the <laughs> uniform is going to be. And so on Tuesday night, we brought out our model in the all-whites with navy trim. And we showed a couple of highlights of BYU's best performances in the all-whites with navy. And the first one we showed, Mitch, involved you at Lavelle Edwards Stadium. Do you recall the game we're talking about? I know exactly which game. Take it away. BYU Boise 2015. So I guess my question is which highlight was first? Was it the 84 yarder <laughs> or was it the 35 yard Hail Mary to say? That is a flex right there from you Mitchell Jurgens. That is a serious flex. Which of my great <laughs> plays did you show? Actually we, we showed uh, and, and they were both awesome. We showed the uh, we showed the final one. The fourth down. Okay. Uh, the, the mini Hail Mary if you will. Uh, to, from, from Tanner Mangum to, to Mitchell Juergens in the end zone. And, uh, you know, I never get tired of seeing that play. I'm sure you never get tired of having to relive it. But that was a big night for you. You had a massive night through the air. Uh, the last one gets all the attention. But uh, let, bring us back to the first one. Yeah, I mean, the first one, it was uh, we, we got pushed back. I mean, it was third and 19 um, from our own 16-yard line. And, and that was just a, a quick play. You know, Coach and I, back in the day, it was whenever we got in trouble, he was a big fan of just... Let's do, go ace 90, which is uh, four verts. Just somebody pop open and we'll go deep and see if something happens. And I, I was fortunate enough to be in the right spot at the right time. It was scrambled drill. So I, I was, um, you know, switched the field and, and Tanner saw me through it. And, and it was a, a good start to the game. And, um, yeah, definitely one that, you know, I won't forget that game. Every time I see the, the all whites, it, it takes me back. And. Just grateful for the opportunity. And then let's uh, let's let's revisit uh, the fourth down play to get you the win. Yeah, I was definitely the uh, I would think the last the last target in Tanner's mind on that play. And really, it wasn't. I, th I think it was a third or fourth read for that. Um, now, we had now let a, me say, quarterbacks yeah. are always looking for the shortest <laughs> wide receiver on the field to throw a home Mary. Always. To. That's the tenant of <laughs> core football. So. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. sorry I, I misspoke there. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, I mean we. The, the plan was not to throw it to the end zone. We had Taron Houck on a 10-yard route. We were supposed to just make a quick completion, get a first down, keep the chains moving, and give us a better shot for a potential uh, field goal, game-time field goal. And uh, uh, once again, Tanner got flushed out, had to do what he had to do, and, and threw it up. And I was, again, fortunate enough to be in the right spot. 
That is Mitchell Jurgens down at the field level and in the Zions Bank end zone for big time banking where the home team feels Zions Bank is for you. The other highlight we showed on the coaches show Tuesday night with the all whites was the first game of the Kalani Sitake era against Arizona at University of Phoenix Stadium, Cardinal Stadium down in Glendale 2016. Jake Oldroyd, it's the game winner. BYU's in the all whites with Navy that night. The remarkable thing there is. The guy that won the game with a place kick at the end of the game is still BYU's <laughs> place kicker six years later, and he's not done yet with his eligibility. He'll be back next year in the Big 12. So BYU will have the same guy kicking in 2016 and 2023, ostensibly. You know, Greg, back in the days of normal eligibility, and I served a mission, like, I had to take... How, how, here's my question. How is he still coming up with enough classes to take the minimum <laughs> amount of credits? There was a couple times I had to fit 15, 16 credits in a semester. If he's doing that, I mean, he, at this point, he's got to be working on his third degree, yeah? Let's do this. Let's take our final two-minute break of this weather-delayed pregame. When we come back, we will have kickoff of BYU and USF finally in Tampa. Back in two on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Do you know what's great about being a Smith's Boost member? Well, for starters, free delivery on orders of $35 or more. Yep, you'll get free delivery on all the Smith's products you love. And as a Boost member, you'll get more rewards, too, like double fuel points on everything you buy. Experience a new level of membership starting as low as $59 a year with Boost by Smith's Rewards. Sign up today at smithsfoodanddrug.com. Restrictions may apply. Smith's, fresh for everyone. Greg Rubel here, introducing you to a new Built Bar Puff, inspired by BYU's famous Cougar Tales, so you can enjoy that maple bar taste while also supporting the BYU football program. Built is once again this year assisting the BYU walk-ons, and new this year,